what better day to do the 2023 Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG recap than on the last stream of the year. So what we're going to do is we're going to do some Law YGO right now, which is a channel that has uh, also been here throughout the year a couple times. You know, we have we've we've watched a couple of their old school videos and they have just published a 2023 Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG recap. And I think we're going to use this as like a guideline because I, I want to talk about so many things when it comes to 2023. Basically, think back of 2023 Yu-Gi-Oh! How has it been? Because honestly, 2023, a lot of stuff happened in the game, you know? Like, uh, if I'm thinking that, like, at the beginning of the freaking year, we still we still had Ishizu tier at full power, a lot of things happened in, in 2023 to talk about. And I, if, I, if I just do it out of my own head, I'll probably forget. So I think it's good that we have a little guideline like this. We're going to do this at 1.25, because otherwise I think we're never going to be done. And you guys have to let I'm gonna me say know. It right now, 2023 was a weird the year for the is. history of Yu-Gi-Oh! in retrospect. While a lot did change over the course of the year, it also felt like very little change for long stretches until the entire- oh, Also, I forget, I need to... I need to pin the video. Uh, once again, shoutouts to the Law YGO, who's been making these videos for every year. Um, and we've been enjoying these a lot throughout the year, uh, the nostalgic ones format was upended and changes happened practically weekly for a bit. That isn't to say we had a bad year in the game. Far from it. For every dud release we got, we also received another absolute banger of a set, with one set released this year easily taking my pick for the best set of all time. But I'm getting ahead of myself. In total, we saw four core sets, three deck building sets, three structure decks, two world premiere sets, two reprint sets, and even a duelist pack. I, I thought you were dead. My death was greatly exaggerated. <laughs> This was so sad, man. As well as three ban lists, 15 YCSs, five WCQs, and one world championship reappearance to pack out this incredible year in the history of the game we all love. Without further ado, let's get down into it. A lot this of stuff. is your Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG 2023 recap. Beginning the year, we had a YCS to remind the player base at large that exiting 2022, nothing had changed. YCS Sydney took place on January 7th, and as was expected, tier laments were still the absolute dominant mega threat we all knew them as. Yep. Taking first place, piloted by Jesse Cotton, Ooh, Jesse. marking his fourth YCS victory, placing him now tied for the record. Didn't Jesse win? Yeah, Jesse won two YCSs this year. Most That's total crazy. YCS victories with Chris LeBlanc. It's no secret that this particular format was considered to be one of the most skill intensive of the era, and that is primarily due to the nature of tier itself, being a massive web of decision point junctures that make the mirror match one of the most complicated man. puzzles to navigate. Dude, this deck, man. Agido banned. Biz Magnamut limited. Kelbeck banned. Keldo limited. Mudora limited. Havness limited. Merly limited. Sharon limited. Instant fusion... Still legal, I think? God damn, man. Kick colors banned. Holy spirit. Elf band. Naturally meaning that the more skilled players in the community that regularly perform well would bubble up to the top of play here. Looking beyond tier for a moment, there were a couple of other faces in the top cut where- I will say, and I'll say it again, uh, I've said it before, tier limit format was not bad. I actually think tier was a good and skillful format, but I still think that I think it's been established Throughout the last, I want to say, two years um, as a content creator, I've been listening a lot to my community, you know, and I think it's been established that even if a even if a format is is like good, quote unquote, even if it produces good games, a lot of people will like that. But a lot of people simply hate to be forced into playing a certain deck to win. I think that is simply I for me, I, I think that's a fact that I've learned over the last one and a half or two years from just like talking to you guys talking to my community it's just like people don't like being forced into one deck right um and and i i think that is just the fact that people don't like that right the the deck can be the best ever like the 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 format can be super skillful or anything like that people will simply not enjoy being forced into one deck for too long so my take on tier 0 formats is simply I can enjoy them as a player. I can I can enjoy um, a good format, a good tier zero format. But I think for the sake of the overall health of the game, the overall enjoyment of the community, I think it's better if tier zero formats go by relatively fast, right? And so I personally, I enjoyed Ishizu tier format, but I'm happy that it 
that it's done, right? I'm happy that it's over because I know how many people didn't enjoy being forced into a tier zero deck, right? Simple as that. And so I think I can, I think you can do both. I think you can enjoy a format and still be happy when it's over, right? Because you can realize that its time has come, right? Its time was over. The time for tier to dominate was was there a couple months, right? But it shouldn't have lasted longer, I don't think. Worth mentioning. Fluanda Reeves would make it all the way to second place oh, here. Showcasing it. how the deck was actually thriving in the extremely slim down matchup spread. Fine tuning King their Boo, thank you for the five. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. Mention shifter and evenly matched. Bistial Sprite similarly held a portion of the top cut here thanks to the Bistials countering out tier quite effectively. But notably, only <laughs> one cleared in the top. Well, this this list throws me back to when I when I played Nimble Sunfish Sprite at a regional uh, with like nine best deals or something like that. <laughs> that was phenomenal. 16, who didn't share their list for this event. Runic would also see a couple of breakouts oh, here in tier variants, focused on getting Majesty's Fiend onto the board as fast as possible to lock out tier and the Ashizu effects. Sword Soul had adapted to main decking the bestial lines as well, mixing the level six bodies well with- I should probably go over here. The Sword Soul tokens to hit level tens like Barone, Changing, and Xing Longwan. This would serve as our reintroduction to the meta right at the start of the year, and shortly hereafter we'd receive our first set release, and with it would be wisps of the metagame for the remainder of the year, just not in the way we expected. Mm, I remember this very vividly. Amazing Defenders. Release yeah. date, January 19th, 2023. Set type, deck building set. Major strategies, Rescue Ace, Pearly, Mikanko. I remember this very vividly because at the time I made a YouTube video covering the three new archetypes, which I probably should. I don't know why I didn't keep doing that. That was a lot of fun and very helpful, I feel like, uh, when a new deck building set drops. Uh, where I made a YouTube video um, covering all three archetypes, what they do, and, and so on and so forth. And I remember, I remember very vividly how like the take at the time when they came out, when they came out was um, like Rescue Ace, unplayable, Pearly, cool idea, but unplayable. Mikanko had potential, right? That was, that was, um, that was kind of the, the, the takeaway for everybody. And it was true at the time. It was true. At, don't say sniffer, dude. The feet are not even on the screen. I, I, I stopped it before it could happen. Stop. Okay. Anyways. Um, Mikanko was good already. Um, not as its own deck, but like Ohime as an engine even saw play in tier for a while, right? It was, it was good. Um, Pearly and Rescue Ace were clearly lacking something that like, you know... Um, they were clearly n lacking something, uh, and I mean, oh boy, did they deliver on whatever they were lacking. You know, they they printed some custom cards for these, but this is kind of the this is kind of the this is continuing a trend of deck building sets releasing interesting archetypes into the game that are very very unpolished and not finished, but then later on receive super super good support. You know, all three of these decks are now meta threats that have all won YCSs. Every single one. Mikanko has won a YCS. Pearly has probably won... I, I probably won a YCS. And Rescue Ace... Has Rescue Ace won a YCS? Yeah, it has. It has. We watched it together. Yeah, it has. So, like... Super, super interesting trend with deck building sets over the course of this year and even last year. How so many of these archetypes have just gotten su incredible support. Pearly hasn't. Okay, maybe Pearly hasn't, but still, it's been a. Pearly won the team YCS. True, Kamal played it in the team YCS. I don't know if that counts, but I, it does count. I think uh, it's yeah, let's let's just count it. We all know Pearly is a good deck. Let, let's let's not get into the nitty gritty here. Um, but yeah. Impact. Hashtag race war. What? Amazing Defenders is probably the textbook case of careful who you bully in high school, as while this set was an absolute dumpster fire on release, it would easily become the absolutely best age set of the yeah. year, with all three of its archetypes becoming meta in their own unique ways. Yeah. That isn't to say it was immediate though, as on release, all three archetypes looked interesting, but were absolutely unplayable in the current meta environment, resulting in probably one of the cheapest sets for a period of time after. These archetypes were Rescue Ace, 
Pearly, and Makonka, each having their own period of experimentation to unplayability to sudden meta threat. So let's dive into each. Rescue Ace was the primary archetype of the set, focused on their boss monster of Turbulence, able to set four different Rescue Ace quick play spells and traps directly from the deck to form a massive control board instantly. This was further boosted by Airlifter, able to search a Rescue Ace spell on summon and Rest contribute in peace, itself to hand or field to summon a Rescue one. Ace from hand in response to an opponent's monster effect on field. Fire Engine, able to summon from hand when a Rescue Ace is summoned, able to summon a Rescue Ace from deck when the opponent summons a monster. Impulse, who can negate the strongest monster's effects for a turn and held the same summon effect as Airlifter. And Hydrant, who searched a Rescue Ace monster once per turn and let you use your quick play spell and traps to turn their set, easily being the most important piece of the archetype not only for this effect, but also because each of the spells and traps gained another effect if Hydrant is on the board. These included Rescue, which revives a Rescue Ace from Grave or a monster from the opponents if you control Hydrant, Alert, which recurs a Rescue Ace from okay, Grave I don't think or we adds need one the explanation for all the effects. Contain, which negates a monster uh, effects and blocks it from I'll attacking, just speed and can also lock it from being used as material those. for extra deck summons if you control Hydrant, and Extinguish, which pops a monster, then negates it and all same name monster effects for the turn if you control Hydrant. Lastly, HQ boosts Rescue Aces by 500, lets you extra normal a Rescue Ace and shuffles back a rescue ace that's engraver banished to draw one. While interesting in theory, Rays wouldn't move to do anything here due to the fact that aside from Hydrant and Turbulence, all of their monsters did effectively nothing, requiring multiple turns of setup for their game plan, at which point you get blown out of the tier limit infested waters, but notably health potential if they found a way around their 50% brick rate. Pearly is a level 1 fairy that can add a Pearly spell trap from the top 3 of the deck to hand on summon, able to reveal a Pearly quick play spell in hand to evolve itself into an exceed named on that spell, attaching that spell as material, all of which have an on field effect tied to the ability to summon a level 1 Pearly from deck by discarding a card, with Happy Memory able to protect a card once that turn and giving its attached monster an added attack in the battle phase. Summoning E Pearly Happiness this way, able to search a Pearly card and have the attack of an opponent's monster after it battles. Pretty Memory boosting both players' life by a thousand on activation, giving it succeed the ability to send a card you control to grave to snatch an opponent's card as material. Summoning E Pearly Beauty, <laughs> able to negate an opponent's monster's effect once per turn. And Delicious Memory, which prevented a monster from battle destruction on activation, boosting the monster is attached to by 300 attack and defense for each material it has. Summoning E Pearly Plump, who can suck up two stellar traps from grave as material per turn. All three of these exceeds also have the effect to attach an activated Pearly Quick Play spell to itself as material as a quick effect, able to easily build up five material. I really like Pearly's uh, design as a deck. I only, I really, really wish they did, hadn't made it. It's boss monster at towers, like unaffected kind of situation, right? Like everything about Pearly, I think is super cool, except for the noir at the end, right? Like the, the way how it's all emergency teleports revolving around the monster. I don't even have an issue that they are not once per turn. I don't think that was like meant to like, I don't think that was a problem. I think that makes sense. If all of them were once per turn, the whole deck wouldn't even been playable to begin with. Um, I, I think it, it they should have just made noir more interesting, right? Noir, the, the big noir needed to be a more interesting card. Um, like, even if they had, honestly, even if they had just given it the quick effect to spin cards and not been unaffected, it would have probably been okay, right? If it had just been, you can spin freaking four cards back into the deck if you make a big noir, could have still been good enough. Right? If it just had not been unaffected. ...for their boss monsters. X Pearly Happiness and Noir, with both able to overlay onto a rank 2 with 5 or more materials. With Happiness able to detach 1 to negate all monster effects on the opponent's field, being unresponsible if it has a level 1 Pearly as material, dealing 1500 burn if it attacks while it has 5 plus materials, and Noir being unaffected by cards while it has 5 plus materials, able to detach 2 to put an opponent's card from field or grave on bottom of deck, being a quick effect if it has a level 1 Pearly as material. As for other pieces, Street is a field spell that gives your Pearly's targeting protection, your exceeds float into a Pearly in deck on destruction, and the ability to attach a Pearly quick play from grave to an exceed in the end phase. My like, maybe, maybe make it so that you can, like, maybe Pearly Street doesn't only protect them from targeting on your on when they summon but like always you know and then noir doesn't is is not unaffected by everything like just leave the unaffected part off of noir but make street a little bit better and then um and then you can't like you can't simply imperm the noir but it's not unaffected you know what i mean like something like a droplet will still out it or like a talents will still out it something like that I think that would have been better. Please targeting protection. Your exceeds float into a pearly and or just untargetable. I mean, yeah, maybe that. Maybe, maybe just make the noir phase. untargetable. I, I, I don't know, man. By paying 500 life points, gives your opponent three options. The unaffected should have been one to hand. And when a pearly exceed is destroyed, adds three. Pearly Everything else in pearly is super cool. I think. Quick plays from grave to hand. And eep, a trap that's a quick exceed rank up for two turns and can banish itself from grave to shuffle three pearly monsters in grave back into deck. While the concept was there for pearly, it was clearly lacking a lot in terms of consistency. As while you wanted to make noir as fast as possible, that usually required access to plump and a really well positioned opening, which with all of their search options being inconsistent, left pearly in the hypothetical camp for now. The conco was the latest crack at making a ritual archetype playable yet again, with Haray either blocking or reflecting damage based on if an equip is on her, searching a Makanko equip when a spell is equipped to her, Nini having the same damage effect and able to quick effect steal an opponent's monster if equipped, Fire Dance summoning a Makanko from hand and reviving an opponent's monster to their field, protecting its equipped monster from effect destruction, purification blocking effect destruction and being able to bounce both a Makanko and an opponent's monster in response. I mean, even though, even though Mikanko was quote unquote the best at release, 
it was only the best because it was splashable in other decks, right? No one cared about these cards at release. And some of these don't even see play to, the, to this day because they we still don't, we don't really play Mikanko as the way it was intended, right? We still play Mikanko more as like an engine in different decks. It's a larger engine now after they released the green one, but it still is not something that we play as like a blind second OTK deck. I mean, some people do, but like in, the, in a meta context, people don't really do that, right? Um, and at release, it was the same. Like we are saying, I, I said Mikanko is the strongest one, but not as its own deck. It was, it was good because Ohime was like a really splashable level six extender, uh, kind of thing, right? Oh, good morning, Wild 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 I, I remember reading Arabesque for the first time and thinking like, God damn, that card hits hard. That card is so good. Arabesque to this day, I think is my favorite Mikanko card because freaking... The fact that you can just go second and bounce a monster and summon from the deck is like that card. That card's wild, man. From deck and swap the equip to that monster. Reflection able to snatch the yellow monster while you control a Mikanko. Okime, their ritual, able to search a Mikanko card oh, while and discarding a card after, and able to equip an equip spell from grave to a monster once per turn on a quick effect. And great Mikanko ceremony, able to cheat out a Mikanko in hand until the opponent's next end phase, able to be banished from. I played it since their release as a going second OTK straight at my locals, and I, it's good enough for that. No, don't, don't, uh, don't. Yeah, it's it's good enough at that. To dump a Mikanko card from deck. But like, I don't think it's good enough as, as, as that kind of deck for like a meta. Akime alone represented a full combo that resulted in a quick effect snatch deal on the opponent's turn thanks to searching ceremony and ceremony being able to dump reflection. The setup of Akime's effect, seeing some experimentation in other strategies already using ritual monsters like Livermancer and Souls builds. Reprints here were extremely light, bringing Renaud, Isold, and Durandal, but not much outside of those. On the whole, Defenders came out with a thud, leaving the primary meta shakeup for the set following three weeks. Yeah, later. when it released, Amazing Defenders wasn't that good of a set. Like the the archetypes weren't worth much because they weren't good yet, and the reprints weren't amazing. I don't think so. Like it was kind of like a a, a stinker of a set when it came out. I mean, looking back now, the cards are were pretty expensive over the course of the year, so if you picked them up early, you made a pretty good deal. And it would give an actual shake-up to the meta that would be felt for months to come. Photon Hypernova. Mm -hmm. Release date, February 9th, 2023. Oh, set God. Core set. Major strategies, Photon, Kashtira, Chaos. Oh, no, Impact, man. Oh, no. Nah. Photon Hypernova was the first core set of the year and immediately would be cracked open for one specific archetype in its support. I can, I can, oh, yeah. All right. I, I need to go back to the normal speed. I, I only did it because the, the effect explanations was a little long. Which we might as well address right here and now. Kashtira would receive its second wave of support here in the form of Riseheart, a level four that can summon itself from hand if you control a Kashtira and can banish a Kashtira card from deck to banish the top three of the opponent's deck face down, making itself level seven if you do so. Scareclaw, who can summon itself by banishing a Kashtira or Scareclaw card from hand or grave, can attack in defense mode and negates the effects of anything a Kashtira or Scareclaw battles. Tier Laments, who can summon itself by banishing a Kashtira or Tier Laments card in hand or grave, milling three on summon from either player, milling two when sent to grave. Overlap, a quick play spell that banishes a 1521 statted monster from hand, grave, or either field to boost another monster by 1500, and, if banished while you control a Kashtira monster, negates the effects of an opponent's monster Overlap. for the turn. Theosis, which summons a Kashtira from deck with a different attribute than one you control land, if banished, can recur a banished Kashtira card to hand. Pressure Planet Ratso, a field spell that adds a Kashtira monster to hand on activation, boosts your monsters by 100 for each attribute on field, and pops a card on field after Shankar era uses its effect once per turn. And Big Bang, a trap that makes a player banish monsters until they only control one if Kashtira exceed is on field and, if banished, detaches a material from a Kashtira exceed you control and summons it. Lastly, and by far the most important, Kashtira Arise Heart is a rank 7 exceed that takes either three materials or can be overlaid onto a Kashtira. If Shankar Era uses effect that turn, banish any card sent to grave, attach the banished card to itself as material once per This card, man. I still... <laughs> no, I don't want to talk about Chain, and could on quick effect attach three to banish card on field face down. So where do I even begin? A Rise Heart alone is a house. Coming from a hero one trick, giving the deck the ability to summon a monster that is effectively Dark Law and DPE rolled into one is already scary nah, enough. Man. But it's made worse by the fact that Kashtira could easily make this in one card thanks to Unicorn from Darkwing Blast being able to search Theosis, able to summon Fenrir, able to search Rise Heart, and so on and so on. A Rise Heart on its own is a terrifying force because of what it does to the remaining meta, as the presence of an easily accessible macro effect with built-in interactions and board lockdown thanks to Shankar Era would do many things to shape the meta around it. But probably more terrifying is what it did to the already present metagame. Tier Limits might not like a macro, but the fact that Tier Limits <laughs> yeah. Kashtira is both a named tier monster, gives the deck mills on turn zero, and merges the pieces of two strategies together made Kashtira a force to be reckoned Probably the strongest card of the year, and we have had SP this year. I was going to talk about that later, but I still think SP wins card of the year. But we'll talk about that later. Reckoned with both pure and with tier, which we'd easily see the results at the following YCS. Photon Galaxy got a major wave of support here. Seeing major, a new very major. Too. So but major that I have never seen these cards in my life. No impact on release. Chaos would see a new overhaul to the archetype itself, with multiple monsters focused on summoning multiple light and dark attribute bodies to facilitate their new synchros, specifically with Chaos Archfiend and Beast, but would similarly see no play for the time being. The various branded lore archetypes would see roughly one new support piece each, with Bestial Baldrake, a fourth Bestial name to add to lineups who can... 
why was it common man i just want to know man why was it common why was it why was it common man i still the biggest crime committed this year probably is the fact that baldrake was a common and an ultra rare in the in the reprint that it got and then in the, all the other bestials are supers and secrets god damn Tribute another light and dark when an extra deck monster is summoned to banish it. Dogmatica getting Albazoa, a ritual boss that is immune to extra deck monster effects and can make the opponent send, on turn one, seven cards from hand or extra deck to the grave. And Dogmatica Matrix, a continuous spell that searches a Dogmatica ritual monster or spell on activation. These cards are And cool. another Dogmatica card if your opponent controls a monster and rips a card from the opponent's extra deck if you control a ritual Dogmatica once per turn. General fusion support in Grangoignol, the Dust Dragon, a fusion of Cartesia and a lighter dark that dumps a level six or higher lighter dark from deck or extra deck to grave on summon and can if the opponent special summons a monster by monster effect banish itself from field or grave to summon a dogmatica from deck or a despia from there's a mini albaz on grave i've never noticed that the fuck is he doing there i thought that was edited in for a second i've never seen that the hell Extra he's just vibing, and yeah. And the Striking Dragon, a fusion of Albaz and a Tri-Type, who can negate the effect of an extra deck monster and bounce a card on field, able to revive either itself or Albaz on the opponent's turn, banishing the one not chosen. Spriggins and Therion receiving Sargus, a rank 8 that can overlay itself onto a Spriggins exceed, adds a Spriggins or Therion card from deck to hand once per turn, and can destroy or bounce a card- I know how people went crazy about Tally Ho Springans when it was announced, and then like, it just didn't do anything on field when a material is detached from an exceed once per turn and tally ho springens a quick play spell that optionally detaches up to three materials from your monsters adds a springens from deck to hand then if you detached any material it is a custom card yeah materials, summons that many springens from hand or grave and tri brigade receiving bucephalus the second a rank five that can only be summoned if you have three or more tri brigade spell traps in grave locks the opponent from responding this was a I, I even though i like this card and it's a good card i think it was kind of a failed design because it didn't do anything for tri brigade like literally nothing like, the, this card is good for, like, Nadir Servant and uh, Dogmatic of Punishment and, and Ultimate Slayer, which is cool in my book, but it didn't do shit for Tri Brigade. The special summons and can banish itself when a monster attacks to banish all opponent's cards, able to send a Tri Type. I don't think this card has hit the board in a Yu Gi Oh game yet. I don't, I don't know. I don't think this card has been summoned. Um, it's only been sent to the graveyard. <laughs> I don't think anyone has has done it. Deck to grave when sent to grave. Each of these would find their places in the meta. <laughs> with Baldrick slotting into almost every deck playing Bestials at this stage, Albazoa forming a rogue deck with the remaining Dogmatica pieces, Grangoignol and Rinbrum slotting into the standard branded fusion lineups, Sargas slotting into any deck wanting to search for Regulus, and Bucephalus seeing use as an Adir Servant or Punishment target that could still yeah. get you to a Garura pitch without compromising the attack value for a Searcher pop. Gishki would receive a few legacy pieces here with Grimness, a level 2 fish that summons a Gishki from deck on summit and can be the entire trip this would have been i think it could have been exciting before ishizu cards uh had we gotten the gishki cards before ishizu cards maybe but they were just a tad bit they were just too late to the party for a Gishki ritual summon, Naramanus, a level 10 ritual that they can are, summon a water from grave ritual summon, has battle protection from extra deck summoned monsters, and can bounce a Gishki ritual monster to hand to negate a monster effect and shuffle the it elf into the band deck. too. I Necromere. mean, yeah, the elf ban too, but I mean, the elf is also, the elf is legal in Master Duel and they still don't do anything there. But like, uh, I, even with elf, this deck could not have competed with uh, like Ishizu tier in the, in the slightest. A ritual spell that summons a Gishki by tributing the exact levels or one monster the opponent controls regardless of level, losing life points equal to the attack of the summoned monster, able to cycle itself back into deck by placing a Gishki ritual monster from grave on top of deck, and focused Aquamir, which searches a Gishki monster and in the end phase could banish itself from grave if you control a water ritual to set an Aquamir from deck except itself. Gishki's support would be a solid line thanks to Abyss being a search for whatever you need to complete the line, but more specifically would become a rogue level splash for sprite decks in the meta thanks to Grimness and Abyss both being level 2, meaning you can set yourself up into Narrow Menace before committing to your gigantic line, seeing some experimentation. Gold Pride would be the new TCG exclusive archetype, with all pieces able to summon themselves if your life points are lower than your opponent. Is Gold Pride... As weird as it sounds, is Gold Pride the best TCG-only archetype this year? I'm... Yeah, right? Like, uh... Free, I mean, it's not freaking Tistina. I mean, this deck at least did see some play, like, uh, uh, some months down the line. Like, once Cash Tira format ended, I remember playing against this at, like, German Nationals, you know? Gold Pride Punk? That was a deck for a little bit. I don't think this was a failed attempt. I mean, this was a... a, a, a it wasn't a Tier 1 deck, but that, may, that doesn't make it a fail, failure. I think this deck was okay. 
Like Gold Pride Punk was a was a like tier two deck at some point. I think that was fine. With Leon being a level three tuner, summoning a Gold Pride from Grave on summon and can synchro summon on the opponent's turn. Nitro Head able to summon a Nitro Token in the opponent's. <laughs> the sad part is I don't even mention Tistina. I mean, <laughs> why would you mention it? Why would you? Standby phase to their field, locking it from Link Material usage, and can pop the token to pop all cards in adjacent zones on quick effect. Captain Carry searching a Gold Pride trap on summon and when sent to Grave can banish up to three Gold Prides from Grave to boost an extra deck summon Gold Pride by five hundred for each. Star Leon, a level six sinker that can gain attack equal to an opponent's monsters on quick effect, also destroying that monster if your life points are lower. Returning to the extra deck, the turn it uses the effect to summon Leon from deck or Grave. Nitro Blaster, a Link two that can pop an opponent's card, popping adjacent cards if your life points are lower. Decking into Nitro Head in the end phase if this effect was used that turn. The crowd goes wild, able to reveal a Gold Pride to search a different Gold Pride in deck, then summon a Gold Pride from hand, taking damage equal to its attack, and start your engines. Which when the opponent summons a monster, reveals three Gold Pride monsters in deck for the opponent to randomly add one to hand, then pops the monster summoned. Gold Pride, just like every TCG exclusive art in the last two years showed a lot of promise on reveal but had clear flaws particularly always... in that getting your life points lower needed out of this is always how it goes right which i find I, f I find it i've criticized this in the past but i find it very boring or not boring but like the way they do tcg exclusive archetypes i'm not the biggest fan of it because the first wave is never playable it's always like it's always kind of promising you know some cards are good some cards are literal just pack fillers which is also i don't know why they do that uh, but it's always like, it feels like a gamble, right? Because you have, you see the first half of the thing and it looks somewhat promising, maybe, except for Tistina, that didn't really look promising. But like, you know, like Libromancer, when I look back of this stuff, I always think of Libromancer where I was like, okay, some of these cards are really, really, really good, but it, it, it just, it depends so much on the second wave of support that it feels so arbitrary, right? It feels so arbitrary. Uh, you just have to guess, you know, is this stuff going to be good or not? Archetype pieces to be consistent. As and then most of the time it's not. It was <laughs> Wild, which itself was not consistent. While it needed a second wave to potentially be meta, it would for the time being see experimentation with Punk as the strategy paid life points a ton to use their own effects, enabling the gold prize. Other one-offs from the set worth mentioning included Gravekeeper's Inscription, a mm -hmm. spell that could, at the start of main phase one, lock either card effects, banishing, or summoning from Grave until the end of the opponent's next turn, being clearly designated as a counter for tier. Plunder Patrol Ship Yord, the fabled Earth ship that can search a Plunder Patrol card with- This one was based. When the opponent summons a monster, able to summon a Plunder Patrol from deck if equipped with one, and can move itself into the Pendulum Scale by recurring a Plunder Patrol from grave to hand. Able to, in the scale, declare an attribute, send itself back to extra deck, and summon a token of that attribute to both fields in defense mode, which not only plugged a major hole in Plunder's extra deck, but also enabled you to access other attributes through the token summon. Big Welcome Labyrinth, which summons a Labyrinth from hand, deck, or grave, bouncing a monster you control to hand, which does trigger the removal by trap condition on most Labyrinth bosses, and can be banished from grave to bounce a fiend you control to hand, or, if you control a level 8 or higher fiend, an opponent card instead, giving Labyrinth a major play starter. Diopolantis the Menacing Mantis, a TCG exclusive that can send insects or plants to Grave up to the non-tuners used for its summon, used in some strategies as a way to this set up Therion lines for dumping some, Lily Boria like and being capital combo. materials needed for Sargus, mixing with the Punk Engine for easy Therion access, and last but certainly not least, Triple Tactics Thrust, a spell that similar to Talos before it can activate if the opponent used a monster effect that turn, able to set- This card, I'll say it, this card does- this is a balanced version of, of Talents, I think. I honestly think Talents is maybe a little bit overtuned as a card. Uh, and even though Thrust is a really, really good card, I think Thrust is way more... Um, I think Thrust is more balanced than Talents. I think it is. I think it's more, I think it's more balanced. I think the whole... You can set a freaking trap that you have to put into your deck to um I, I didn't say it was a balanced card i said it was more balanced than talents um and i think the main reason why thrust is even so good is because talents exist i think if if because if talents wasn't a card uh you wouldn't even be able to play thrust in a lot of situations because you simply wouldn't have a good target for most matchups the simple thing is that most of the time when you can play this card because in you don't care which matchup you play Tal thrust into talents is always going to be good it's always going to be a good move right like that's why thrust is so good like you can thrust into other cards but they those are not guaranteed to be good in a certain matchup right like yeah you can thrust for evenly but you have no guarantee that thrust is going to be good for that but that evenly is going to be good in that matchup yeah you can thrust for change of heart but that that card's not good against every matchup like you can you you can thrust into a starter card but maybe you need a board breaker you can thrust into duster but that's not good into every matchup like the card that makes thrust so playable is talents like you will you are never going to see someone play thrust without talents but you see people play talents without thrust because talents is the i think talents is the more broken card uh and honestly 
even though you can thrust for one of trap cards, um, which people do that eventually, I think that is the least powerful part of thrust. Um, that is something that you only do that. Like you play the 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 the, the steps in deck building that you take to to play thrust to set a trap is you want to play thrust already in your deck and because you already have thrust in your deck you're like okay i could side deck one trap to make the thrust better going first after siding right like that's a it's like a cherry on top on like a card that's already you already want to have the card in your deck the reason to it's never the reason to include thrust in your deck it's never the reason because you can set a trap going first because if that was your reason you can just play the trap immediately like if you want to if you want to play, you can just side deck traps for going first. You're never going to play thrust to search traps. Like, because if that was the case, you could just play uh, the traps e e directly, you know? Um, the, the, the card is very powerful. Don't get me wrong. The card is very, very powerful. Um, but I think if I had to point out an issue with the power spells in the game, I don't think I would point at thrust. I think I would point at talents is what I'm trying to say. Um, the only thing I really don't like about Thrust is that they made it a secret rare and they, it's kind of like right now after the rarity collection, um, of course, Diabell Star package and SP from the most recent set. But before the most recent set, like the rarity collection would have made all of the non-engine pieces super accessible with the only exception being Thrust, which I think is uh, that's the one thing I really don't like about it. But I will say um this card was only really quote unquote uh, mandatory uh during cash tira format ever since cash tira format has ended um i would say you could get away without playing it and honestly for the most part it was even like probably better to not play it in a lot of decks i mean last ycs at ycs bologna i think thrust was like very very un unpopular even like it's a it's a very format dependent non-engine card um you know we're probably going to see a reprint in Maze like we did with Chimera. That would be one way to make Maze of Millennia like an insane set. If they throw Thrust into Maze of Millennia, that set's going to go so hard. Like that, that set's going to have Thrust, Bonfire, and uh, what's the other one? Transaction Rollback? That, that'd be a sick set. Set a spell or trap from deck, unable to activate it that turn, or if the opponent controls a monster too, can add it to hand instead with no activation restrictions. Being a massive staple in the meta thanks to being able to generically search literally any normal spell or trap in the game. With this support wave, Kashtira would push for a powerful showing at YCS Leon the same weekend, being the first deck to truly give Tyr a challenge, no. although Tyr would continue to be the top deck in the meta. As a note, I mean, it was just a matter of Kashtira needed to either go first or have Shifter against Tyr, and it's like, it was just still, Tyr was still better overall, but the matchup was scary. I I lost uh i lost in top 16 i think to to cash tira because they shifted me there was also a team ycs in mexico city on the same day but unfortunately due to poor coverage we only have a couple of lists out of the entire top cut there so we're going to have to skip it for this look back cash tira took its new pieces here to not only perform their one card arise heart setup but also now to completely lock the opponent out of the game before it started with all of the level seven swarming options Such now provided list, to them man. shanker era and day below sis boards became a lot more possible than before resulting in many boards losing all monster or spell trap zones before the opponent even got a turn to play which while not common was entirely possible for the deck to achieve now. Subtier would have an odd top cut appearance here, utilizing the nature of floodgates and stun to try and counter out tier that way with Dimension Shifter already proving to be a valid counter option for the strategy. Jesse Cotton wouldn't hold the tie for most YCS victories for long though, as Chris LeBlanc would win the event on Tier Laments, taking back the title with his fifth YCS win, pushing that bar up just a little higher. Although this event was a clear showing of Tier being the best deck still, even with the new release, it would be disingenuous to say that the showing here was 100% uncompromised. As though it had been announced earlier in the week of Hypernova's release, a new ban list took effect on February 13th, directly following YCS Leon, and with it came the culling wave to the Tier 0 meta threat. Newly banned were Artifact Scythe, firmly Right, I remember this. This oh, now I remember. YCS Leon was like so frustrating because I think the ban list was already out, wasn't it? I think uh, I think it was so frustrating because the ban list was already out, and it was like the last tournament. I always hate when that happens. I always hate when that happens when uh, when like a ban list is already out but you have to play a super big tournament with like the old ban list that always feels like so so much of like a non-important event i hate when that happens
directly ending the Sanctum lockout. Yeah, 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 I remember. Storm wins, removing oh, blue God, lockout statue. Lane. You technically cash tears, but no one was playing it yet. Sprite Elf, one of the most egregious combo enablers ever printed. And Tier Limits, Kit Close, the best yeah, card in the th tier this deck. This one was massive, dude. A country mile. Newly limited were Akito, Kelbeck, Keldo, Mudora, Havdis, Murley, and Sheer. <laughs> all hits the Tier Limits. Yo, Placing I forgot. They did all of that at once, man. Holy shit, man. God damn all but one of their 2022 monster lineup on the limited list. In addition to Ancient Fairy Dragon being released from the list with the caveat of not picking effect until a future set release due to an errata <laughs> coming down the pipeline. <laughs> Lastly, Unlimited were Destrudo, Jet Synchron, O-Lion, Servant of Endymion, Lithosagem, Yada, and Spiral Resort, being a large cleanup wave to cards that no yeah. longer were issues with either the passage of time or- Looking back, phenomenal ban list because none of the unlimited, you always know is, you know it's a good decision to unlimit something, if it just doesn't cause a problem for a very, very long time. Because I probably said, I mean, I probably said at the time, like, Resort is scary or anything like that. I mean, Master Plan is still banned, so it's probably whatever. But it's like, none of these cards have caused any any trouble, so it's Or with it's their good. other problem cards being banned. With Tier 0 officially quelled, the metagame had opened up in such a way that it was and wasn't clear what was about to happen. As while we knew that Kash Tira was clearly going to be the best deck moving into this new frontier, anything else could rise up in this newly... It is very interesting looking back now how Tier Lament was dead but it wasn't actually dead because it came back full swing after the arise heart ban right it was just like it was only dead because of it of the environment right which is it's an it's an important lesson to learn is that decks sometimes decks really um just they depend on their environment right like it's it's something that's uh something that i specifically always mention it when i'm talking about runic like certain decks just function the way they function. They don't have that much room for non-engine or anything like that. Um, and because of that, they just depend on their environment. They depend on the matchups. And just like, it was cash tier off format. Tier limit just didn't have a good environment to uh, to thrive because you couldn't do that much in tier about a Rysar. Like you needed to draw a very specific out. Otherwise you did not play the game. And then on top of that, they had shifter in their deck. Like it was just not good open metagame space. A team YCS would be held in Las Vegas the next weekend, and it would give us an idea of yeah. what to expect moving into this meta environment, though not a perfect picture since this was a 3v3 event. Right, this was the this was the time where people still thought Branded was a good deck for a, while, for a little bit. As expected, Kashtira would be the primary threat of the event, notably being the deck played by all three members of Team Back for Seconds, who would win the event. Without the threat of tier present, the deck had entered a space where it could be built fully into its own game plans rather than having to counter out tiers, resulting in bringing more protective options for board lockout strategies, specifically in Forbidden Lands. Which My take on Kashira, by the way, is that like the, the I think the Kashira mirror match was actually kind of cool. It reminded me of the Zodiac mirror match. Um, and I think, honestly, looking back, Kashira was like, it was the best deck in the format. Um, and it created this kind of situation where if you wanted to play, if you wanted to play a different deck, you had to prepare for Cash Tira and you had to play a bunch of outs to a Rysard and you had to draw those outs. Um, otherwise, you would lose, right? Um, and that is toxic in some ways. In other ways, it also does have some possibilities in it that statement offers some possibilities because it, it doesn't it's not cash tira wasn't a deck that locked you out of playing other decks like it wasn't tier zero in that way uh but it's it, it you could play other stuff because the cash tira board was highly outable right um so you did have there's a couple bad things you can say about cash tira but it didn't um it didn't completely gatekeep other other decks, you know? Like, some graveyard strategies would struggle a little bit more than others, right? Because if they didn't see an out, they couldn't play the game at all. But, like, as opposed to, for example, like, some sprite variations or something like that. But, like, um, it's... Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of interesting. Because on one hand, I really hated Cash Tira. On another hand, it was, like, it was beatable, right? Like, all I, I got all the way through Cash Tira format without playing Cash Tira at a major event a single time. And I did top a, a decent number of events, you know, like uh, YCS London, German Nationals. I guess there's another ban list that removes Mind Hacker from it, but like I got through this format without ever feeling forced to play Cash Tira. So I guess it was somewhat okay in that regard, even though I still didn't like the deck.
counter out the primary counters to Shanger Era of Book of Moon and Eclipse. Branded would see a bit of a resurgence here, taking up the second largest Take percentage w. of the top cut, primarily due to the fusion space being a lot more open now than before, thanks to Tear being missing, but also because a new tech had been discovered for the deck, that being Gimmick Puppet Nightmare. Branded Expulsion from Power of the Elements had found a target worth putting on the opponent's board, and with it, players could lock special summoning from the opponent for an entire turn, which would cause the trap to become staple in the strategy for a long period after, being without question one of the best things you could be doing in Branded, much to the dismay of Branded fans. Labyrinth would also see a resurgence here, primarily thanks to Big Welcome Labyrinth giving the deck a no. powerful new start option. Primarily thanks to Ryan Yu. <laughs> Notably, also playing the new Bacephalus II for use with Dogmatica Punishment so you could still access Garura draws without sacrificing your attack power for the pop. Sprite would see some of the more interesting adjustments here following the ban of their primary enabler, with some opting for a live twin splash and others fully switching gears into Kashtira Sprite, and even a pivot back into the runic path for the deck. This Hell would set yeah. the stage for this new meta landscape, being followed up by a structure deck released the following week, which would introduce yet another strategy into the pool worth experimenting with. Ooh, trap tricks. Oh, th this was a this was a good moment because it gave the beware the, of trap the tricks. budget option. Release date you know? February twenty third, twenty twenty three. Set type structure deck. Major strategy. I still remember how hyped people were when Pack did that. You know, like uh, go undefeated at locals with just three structure decks or anything like that. You know, that was kind of cool. Even though looking back, I mean, now the deck is I want to say kind of irrelevant, but still having a. I mean, it's like tier three, and like I mean. I guess that's still good for a budget deck. You know, you get like 30 bucks for like a little bit of non-engine for for like a tier three deck. That's okay. Trap Tricks. Impact. So why don't you take a seat right over there? Beware of Trap Tricks was the first of three structure deck releases <laughs> this year, and it would be an attempt of revolutionizing the trap deck of Trap Tricks from the end of Zexal and early Arc 5 eras, attempting to bring them into the modern day. This would include the new cards Pudisha, who searched Trap Tricks Garden on normal and temporarily banished an opponent's special summon. I've never heard anyone say Pudisha. I, I called it Pudica always. I don't know. Monster on special. Arachnocampa, who protected back row from destruction once per turn and could special summon herself from hand on a quick effect if you control a trap tricks. Garden, a field spell that lets you normal an extra trap tricks each turn, protects a plant or insect from battle destruction once per turn, and can banish a monster to summon a trap tricks from hand or grave. Holutea, a trap that summons itself as a level 4 normal monster, can be activated the turn. Is it still the best structure deck or does Red Dragon Archfiend? Oh, I mean, I think uh as its own deck it might still be the best structure deck from the year i still think from overall meta impact you just have to give it to red dragon archfiend or fire king i mean fire king is probably the best one overall in the long term i the the red dragon archfiend deck is still cool because it's um like it the 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 resonator stuff is very splashable um and even though like it's already been done a little bit with bestials uh i think moving forward there's like some some stuff you can do with the red dragon archfiend stuff but like uh, overall it's gonna be fire king turn it set by discarding another trap and can be banished from grave to summon a trap tricks from grave terrifying trap hole nightmare which can if the opponent has special summoned that turn pop a monster with 2000 or more attack they control and if you have another whole normal trap in grave banish a monster from their grave and pingua Kula, a rank four that is unaffected by trap and monsters who shares a type with its materials can detach a material to search a trap tricks monster from deck and can attach a monster your opponent controls that is sent was dark world this year too or is dark world 2022 i forgot grave or banished by card effect once per turn this support would do a lot in terms of speeding up trap tricks for the modern environment specifically in pudisha garden and holtea making okay. it far simpler to use sarah's effects usually now able to trigger both effects in a turn to generate massive amounts of advantage reprints here included mermelo dionea godarla kumungus ash blossom raigeki feather duster floodgate trap hole trap trick artifact sanctum <laughs> Naturia Sacred Tree, Evenly Matched, Rafflesia, Alumaris, and Sarah. While this would introduce Trap Tricks as a viable strategy in the meta, it would be poorly positioned overall, as Trap Decks were already being cited against in major ways due to Labyrinth already being a potent meta threat, leading to Trap Tricks' home resting in the range of a rogue deck. Shortly after this, we'd see the next big world premiere set for the TCG, and it would make its attempt to shake up what the Trap Tricks could not. Maze of Memories. Release date, March 9th, 2023. Set type, import, reprint, premiere. Major strategies, Gate Guardian, remaining history archetype pieces. Impact. Wake up. Wake up. Maze of Memories. Wasn't this, isn't this set just like Axel Stardust from like a competitive perspective? I'm not, I can't remember another, like, I, it, it's just Axel Stardust, right? This is an odd set to say the least, as in a weird way, it did many things that the various other sets did rolled into one. Being a reprint set of major cards it from the last few years. It had Baron reprint, true. It had Baron and Chimera, true. Those, like, from a reprint perspective, those were decent at the time. 
collectors, an OCG import set of all remaining history archetype collection cards we were still missing, and to top it all off, duality a came from the set. No, duality and assault synchronized battles of legends. That's not Maze of Memories. OCG exclusive series of cards retraining various cards related to Gate Guardian. So let's start there. Gate Guardian would receive a series of contact fusion mods. Uh, I, I'll, I'll two times the Gate Guardians, okay? Monsters. Able to banish the original three Gate Guardian materials from hand, field, or grave to summon. With Thunder and Wind, a fusion of Sangha and Kazajin, able to add a spell or trap that mentions the trio from deck to hand, floating into a banished Sangha or Kazajin on removal. Wind and Water, a fusion of Kazajin and Suijin, able to negate a spell or trap twice per turn, floating into a banished Kazajin or Suijin on removal. Water and Thunder, a fusion of Suijin and Sangha, able to drop an opponent's attack to zero twice per turn, floating into a banished Suijin or Sangha on removal. <laughs> and combined, a fusion of Sangha, Kazajin, and Suijin, able to negate and destroy a card that targets your cards thrice per turn, able to float into any of the other fusions or original Gate Guardian on removal. In addition to these, they also received retrains of various cards used by Para and Docs in the anime, like Labyrinth Heavy Tank, able to be normal without tributing, able to place a Gate Guardian piece from hand or deck into the spell and trap zone once per turn, popping a card on field if you control a labyrinth wall card when you do. Shadow Ghoul of the Labyrinth, able to be discarded. I will say these the card the card sounded kind of cool. Like if you were uh if you're into playing these kind of anime decks, they did they did sound kind of cool because they're like they they weren't complete ass, you know? They were like they weren't good competitively, but they were like they sounded like a cohesive deck at least. To add a labyrinth wall card from deck to hand, able to pop a battling opponent's monster by banishing itself from grave while you control a labyrinth wall card. Labyrinth wall shadow, a field spell that gives non-high level monster summoning sickness, can place a gate guardian piece from deck into the spell trap zone once per turn, and can pop a low attack monster at the start of the opponent's battle phase. Double attack wind and thunder, able to pop a card if you control a gate guardian monster, and can banish itself from grave to shuffle back a gate guardian piece. Re Roku Guardian, able to have the opponent's life points to boost a gate guardian monster by that much with the same grave effect as double attack, and prey of the Jirai Guma, able to be summoned as a monster and pop a monster in the same column with the same grave effect. While an interesting thought experiment, the gate guardian cards would do absolutely nothing, with their biggest experimentation being heavy tank being teched into Kashira solely as a level seven normal summon body. As for the imports, wake up your elemental hero revolutionized the hero strategy by both replacing Trinity in the extra deck for an they attacking did. finisher, as well as being a turn one extender by being able to be popped with DPE did. to access Shadow Mist, who in turn accesses your mask change on turn one. That's right, it's an OTK enabler that also gets you to Dark Law. Needless to say, this along with another card released later in the year would actually do a lot to make Hero far more playable, though still a rogue option for the regional level at the time. Excel Synchro Stardust Dragon, or Ass Dragon I mean, for short, revives a level two or don't don't say Ass Dragon for short. <laughs> That card, this card has just been incredible. This card is incredibly good. Um, yeah, I, this this card is just phenomenal. There's not much to say about it. Lower tuner on synchro summon and can on a quick effect tribute itself to summon Stardust Dragon from the extra deck, then synchro summon using monsters you control, becoming a solid option for various synchro strategies, namely for being a level eight that instantly gets you to a level ten on its own, making Barone that much easier to access. Firewall Dragon Dark Fluid Neo Tempest Terra Hertz is a Link 5 that negates the effects used by an opponent in the battle phase. Can send a Cybers from deck or extra deck to grave. I hate him, dude. Not even because it's a good card. It's because it, this card has changed Twitch chat for good, man. Twitch chat has lost their minds after this card came out. On a quick effect to gain its attribute Twitch and boost by 2500 once per is turn. is unbearable since this card has been released. Whenever a Cybers hits the board in, in Master Duel, they're like, oh my god, yeah, Terra Hertz line for game. I and can attack it. up to the number of attributes it has, being an option for Math Mech to use as a finisher. Reprints here included Wind Up Kitten, Nimble Angler, Rika Petal, Udon, Guardian Chimera, Ancient Fairy Dragon with its new errata, Barone, Teardrop, Avermax, and Solemn Judgment. With Chimera and Barone being massive reprints here, dropping their price very significantly. YCS Lima would take place the same weekend, and with it we'd see the meta settling in a strange direction. And this is this is what I mean when I say like Kashira. This was even before the Mind Hacker ban, right? Kashira was probably the best deck in the format, but it didn't really quote unquote gatekeep everything else, right? Like people were able to perform with other stuff. Um I mean, this is one hell of a breakdown, you know? Like, it's one hell of a breakdown. Like, you can say anything you want about Cash Tira. Like, the deck was sometimes boring to play against toxic uh, mechanics or whatever, but it didn't lock out the other decks like, for example, Tier Limits did. While Kashira was still the top deck in representation, it wouldn't be by a large margin here. With Naturia Runic rising rapidly in popularity, able to quickly make your Naturia synchros backed up by the Runic spells for a massive control game plan. Trap Tricks would see a top here thanks to the interactions of Pudisha, Holtea, and Sarah able to quickly establish an interaction-heavy board, while also being less susceptible to Imperm thanks to Sarah's trap immunity. Plunder Patrol would make a crack into top 8 here thanks to Yord and a mix of the Runic cards, providing control and resources to quickly set up their lines. Salad would make it all the way to top 4 here, sporting the Adventure Package in a heavy 14 this i have no explanation for in hand trap lineup the adventure package in particular made a splash here as a choice for three of the top four decks including jean guero's first place adventure sprite adding in more rank and link two options to help fill the void from the loss of elf such as reaper Dokus, who can change the type of a monster you summon with mannequin cat to guarantee a summon from your deck three weeks after lima the largest event of the year would be held being the 250th ycs being such a major event that it was held at three places at once being bogota los angeles and london on march 31st 
These events would not only be some of the highest attended YCS events ever held, with London and Los Angeles being the second and third largest events separately, but they would also spark a massive revolution in the YCS space known as Time Wizard events. While Time Wizard formats have technically been a sanctionable event for OTSs to run, being older format tournaments, they had... This is... It's not part of the competitive scene, or like, the competitive game, but like, this is a, also one big takeaway for me personal this year, is I was super, super happy to see the rise of Time Wizard. Specifically, Edison has been very, very fun for me personally this year, and being able to go to like YCSs and play like Time Wizard events on the Fridays and all that kind of stuff. I am very, very happy that this kind of stuff is getting more popular, and I hope it continues growing in the future to the point where we can get like, um, we can get bigger and bigger Time Wizard tournaments. Um, like you know around the world i th I think it's super super fun i i i love it and it's uh, even though i mean i'm still gonna play competitive Yu-Gi-Oh, like current Yu-Gi-Oh all the time probably but like uh, the time wizard thing is is, is great I, I love it not really been recognized by konami at an official event level until this point with officially sanctioned tournaments being held at these ycs's for the ever-growingly popular edison format in addition to their curated format selections from the previous milestone ycs's which ironically were held during not quite as popular formats and as such did not get the pull of players quite like edison events did as such konami would make it a regular occurrence after this for ycs's that had the event space to hold what were called time wizard grand tournaments on the side of the main event usually for Edison format, which would be effectively a mini YCS for that format, becoming one of the most popular side events ever for these tournaments. Yeah, As nice. for the events themselves, Bogota Colombia would be the least attended of the three, but would still have over a thousand players, which is nothing to scoff at. Castillo would take the majority of the top cut as expected, including the tournament itself piloted by Esteban Valquez, notably playing more unique to the deck hand traps like Gamma and Ghost Mourner. Los Angeles, California would be the middle child of the three, but would still be the third most attended YCS of all time with 3,225 players. We would see a massive spread of decks across the top 64, but would boil down to one deck taking the lion's share of representation, being the same Kashira deck we're used to seeing at this stage, taking first place piloted by Pauli Aronson. Taking a dive into some of the more unique lists here, Eight Axis would crack the top 64, being a deck focused That's on swarming crazy. the board with various level 8 threats to enable large damage pushes or rank 8 mega threats, being tooled as a blind second- I mean, that looks like a deck that slaughters Kashira mainly. <laughs> like, you just blow up their board and kill them. Pick with cards like Alpha, the Kaijus, and Lightning Storm. Marincess would see a top spot here thanks to the power of Aqua Argonaut, able to flood the board on the opponent's turn and negate a spell or trap on the same effect. Code Talker would get a top here thanks to the Math Mech package, as Circular provided so much by itself for the strategy as a starter that the rest can pile on for maximum advantage generation and power. Scareclaw Punk Kaiju Adventure is yet another what pilot the hell? Deck, this time taking advantage of the ability for the Scareclaw cards to combo off themselves into Lightheart for severe advantage generation. Pure Ricka would see a top here as well, oh, being no. different from the various Actually, other Rickas on Avalon tops we've no. seen by not playing- You know what? This individual is based. No, I take it back. This one is based. This one does not have any of the dumb shenanigans. This one's fine. Hey, I like copies him. of Lokai in the deck. Instead, utilizing Rika in their purest state. London, UK would be the largest of the three, being the second largest YCS in history, only sitting behind. I think this. I mean, it's not really capped, but it's somewhat capped because I I remember. I don't think London was that big. I think it was just the pre-registers that were that many. I think a lot of people didn't show up. I, I think we had less than 3,000 who actually showed up. I'm not entirely sure on the exact number, though. 2012's Long Beach. And while Kashira would be a dominating strategy for the top 64 here, too, there was a lot it more was fight. Three, it was 3,600 that signed up, but I, I think we had a lot of no-shows, but I, I'm not entirely sure. Over the middle chunks of representation here, with Branded, Lab, and Rickasun Avalon all taking three slots each, Math Mech taking four, and Sprite taking a shocking ten slots between its more pure and life twin variants, with Samir Bakar taking the event on a more pure variant with a Melfi splash with a single copy each of Caddy, Penny. I'll say it. Uh, Dinka Bui probably made the best deck for this event. I think he he was the the more likely one to win, but I, I think he got unlucky in top four or something like that. But this was awesome. This was uh this was crazy. I don't know how like I I mean I, I guess I know how. Like Sprite was fine, you know, it's not like it's not like crazy or anything. It's a little bit crazy, but yeah. And Melfi of the Forest to access Herald of the Arc Light on the opponent's turn. Looking at the results for all three together, Kashira had clearly come out on top, with Sprite and Naturia Runic throwing up results for second and third place with multiple other strategies close behind. But whether or not those results would hold up following the next corset release was what remained to be seen. Mm. This 
was probably my least favorite release of the year. At least l leading up to it, I was not a big fan of, of this set. Like, I, I expected it to not be very, like, not a very good addition to the format. I didn't like that. Cyberstorm Access. Release date, May 4th, 2023. Looking back, uh, I'm fine with it because it gave me Quem. But still, like, at the time, I didn't, I didn't look forward to it. Three. Set type, core set. Major strategies, super heavy samurai, monodium, pearly. Impact. <laughs> Cyberstorm Access was a hotly anticipated release as it contained primarily support for previous archetypes that would change their status in the metagame, not only for their own decks, but as an engine to use in practically everything. That engine would be the Super Heavy Samurai engine, which was primarily made possible thanks to Prodigy Wakaoshi, a pendulum that can, if you have no spells or traps in Grave while in scale, set another Super Heavy Samurai scale from deck to summon itself. 99 times out of 100, you're going to use this to set Monk Big Ben K, who can, while you control a Super Heavy Samurai, add a Super Heavy Samurai soul from deck to hand, which in turn can let you go practically anywhere you want to go, be it a level 8 Synchro through a combination of Soul Gaia. I mean, if we're going to go down and explain all the things you can do with Wakaoshi, we're still going to be here in two hours. A booster in Wakaoshi, which when you weave in a motorbike with it can get you to Barone via Ash Dragon, <laughs> a rank 4 exceed through the same method, and all sorts of late climbing shenanigans thanks to their previous... Imagine like you you scroll, you you skip like an hour ahead and it's like, and that's how you FTK using Wakaoshi. This linked monster Scarecrow, which can discard a card to revive a super heavy samurai to its link arrow. Not only was this super splashable, but it also had an FTK attached to it for the pure variant that could very simply end the game straight away, but die to a single hand trap. But even still, the deck and its pure variant could get away with a metric ton of non-engine thanks to its starters being so powerful. Monadium was the fourth of the Vsauce lore archetypes, primarily being a series of level two tuner monsters that summon themselves from hand if you control Vsauce, or a 1521 statted monster, floating into more copies of themselves on destruction with an added effect, with Fearless boosting your synchros by 500 in battle that turn, and Meek boosting the newly summoned Meek by two levels. Their Vsauce variant was Reum Heart, who could pop a Monadium or 1521 monster to summon itself from hand, adding a Monadium card from deck to hand on summon, being used with the tuners to make Prime Heart, notably not requiring a non-tuner, can attack each turn up to the number of tuners used to summon him, is untargetable if made with a Monadium tuner, and if it leaves- God, I'm just remembering the, the freaking Poppy Pasta. Cause this, I'm not remembering, I'm, oh God. This was the time when, right after this set released, right? This was the time where everyone was the waiting for the ban list, right? No one freaking cared about any of this stuff. I mean, people played a little bit of, uh, of Super Heavy Samurai or whatever, you know, but for the most part, this, this set, pretty much it just introduced one more deck into the pie chart of 25 decks or whatever. And everyone was just, this was the time where every single Konami tweet or anything like that, it was just full of people asking for the ban list, right? Like, every that's all that people wanted you know a, a rice heart it's not even been out for that long but people were so sick of a rice heart that like no one cared about anything you know they they <laughs> and then they kept dropping at like freaking 6 p.m they kept dropping tweets when they normally would drop the ban list they kept dropping weird ass tweets like freaking Minadium prime heart has a special defensive ability that stops your opponent from targeting it with card effects yada 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 it was it was actually Top level comedy. It was actually insane. Um, but yeah, I, I, God damn, was it a miserable time for waiting for Cash Tira format to finally end, man. The field floats into a 1521 or Vsauce Starfrost in Grave or the Banished Zone. They also had Imaginings, which revealed the Monadium or Vsauce in hand to draw two and place one in hand on bottom of deck, able to banish itself from Grave to treat a 1521 as a tuner that turn. Obsession, which pops a monster you control to add a Peaceful Planet Calarium from deck to hand or any Monadium spell. Yeah. Trap if you already control planet, able to banish itself from grave to summon a Vsauce or a 1521 from hand, Peaceful Planet Calarium, a field spell that adds a Monadium or Vsauce on activation, boosts light monsters by 100 for each tuner in grave, and special summons a tuner that is destroyed once per turn, and reframing, an omni negate counter trap if you control a synchro, only destroying if you have Vsauce or a 1521 in grave, and can be banished from grave to shuffle back up to three Monadiums in grave. While an interesting direction for the synchro line to take for Vsauce lore, Monadium on release wouldn't be heavily played, still lacking the power level of Kashtira or tier limits before it, but it would be experimented with as it received more support. Though technically not a Monadium, related to the archetype was Vicious Astraloud, a fusion of Vsauce and a 1521, must be contact fused by banishing materials from field or grave, and pops a monster on field on summon, gaining attack equal to half of either that monster's attack or defense, being a powerful piece for any pile deck using Vsauce and any of its variants, particularly good with Monadium and Scareclaw. The final Albaz lore drop is here, for now, bringing us Quem, who dumps an Albaz or card that- Doggies, Quem!
mentions it from deck on summon, and revives an Alabazar card that mentions it if a card leaves the extra deck. Bestial Aluber, primarily interesting for being a level 4 Bestial Tuner. I'll be on the How did you guys call him last time we played? What was it? You said Horny Aluber, right? That's what you guys said? I still don't know why. Sanctifier Dragon, a fusion of Alabaz and a light spellcaster who can't be targeted, can on the opponent's turn summon two monsters from grave, one to each side of the field, and can revive itself by tributing a monster in each EMZ and the center column on each side of the field. It's got horns? Oh, because it has horns! I, di I didn't, I did not, I did not get that. Okay, now I get it. Okay, I see, I see. Bistial Dispater, a dragon locked level 10 synchro that can summon a banished light or dark to your <laughs> I field, did not and get can it. shuffle back a banished card when the opponent activates a monster effect, destroying it if the shuffled back card went to your deck, <laughs> or negating the effect if it went into the opponent's. And Despian Lulu Waylith, a level 12 synchro that requires a level 4 tuner, who can permanently boost all of your monsters by 500 and negate the effects of a face up card on field when a monster leaves the extra deck, and floats into a light spellcaster from hand or deck who has equal attack and defense in the end phase of the turn it's sent to grave. All of these would see some variation of play throughout the remainder of the year for various reasons, but for the time being, wouldn't change much in terms of branded's placement in the metagame. Cyber stacks would get a powerful new boss monster and firewall dragon singularity, a rank six that bounces cards yeah. the opponent controls up to the number of- Because that's what they needed. Monster super types you control or- There's only one thing that cyber stacks need and that's uh, they need uh, they need to be deleted from the game. Or in the grave, being ritual, fusion, synchro, or exceeds, boosting by 500 for each return, and revives the cyber and grave if it destroys a monster it points to in battle. This would be a great mesh with the previous Neo Tempest Terahertz, thanks to it providing monsters needed for the bounce to go through, in addition to receiving Cyber Sage and D-Save Worm to fulfill the Ritual Infusion conditions. Pearly would receive its first wave of additional mm -hmm. support here in Pearly Lee, which searches a non-quick play Pearly spell on normal summon and can tag into a Pearly Exceed by using a quick play spell in Grave, attaching it as material to the summon Exceed, and Sleepy Memory, which drops the next battle damage you take to zero. Uh, Regis, thank you for the 11 months. Yes, I had, uh, I had very good uh, Christmas holidays. How about yours? Uh, the Pearly... I mean... This literally, I think if you could make custom cards for that make Pearly playable, it was exactly this. Like, I, I think that they literally, there was someone at the Konami office and they were like, you make Pearly meta, like make it meta with like, you get two cards in the next set, but make it count. Right. And they made they, you come up with those cards has the standard summon effect and lets it succeed draw one during the opponent's standby phase. Both of these would help to make Pearly a potent meta contender. No like TCG ass uh, design seven cards where six of them are pack filler and one of them is like barely playable. No, like two slots, two slots, GG's. With Pearly Lee in particular making your lines far more powerful, allowing you to search for My Friend on Normal, which in turn would reliably get you to Delicious Memory by revealing three copies in deck, giving you reliable access to Noir on turn one. Mekonko would receive Hu Lee, with a standard- Same here, honestly. Both of these cards looking back for like the all the Mekonko decks, the most annoying shit that they do is these two, like... These two fuckers right here, man. Oh god, I hate playing against those. Battle damage effect, giving targeting protection to all Mikankos while equipped with a card, and searches a Mikanko trap when it initially is equipped with a card, and Mayo Washidori, which protects its equipped monster from effect destruction, bounces a card after a Mikanko battles, and can, while in grave, special summon a Mikanko from grave. Thank God Chengying exists, otherwise I, I'd have a problem with me with Huli. Itself to it. Mayo Washidori in particular was an excellent addition to the pure Mikanko deck, giving the deck a reliable way to recur the smaller bodies, which in turn fueled more digging into the deck with their effects when equipped. Boosting the deck's viability, but not quite enough to break into the meta yet. Gold Pride received their second wave with Rollerballer, with a standard summon effect and the ability to fuse on a quick effect for a Gold Pride fusion. Pinballer, a fusion of Rollerballer and at least one other Gold Pride, able to equip opponent's cards to it on summon up to the materials used, the effect being unnegatable if your life points are lower, and tags into Rollerballer from Grave if the effect is used. Chariot Carry, a rank 3 Bucket exceed that ball. can search a Gold Pride spell by detaching one, allowing you to dump a Gold Pride if your life points are lower, tagging into Captain Carry and Grave if this effect was used. That came out of nowhere, a quick play spell that specials a Gold Pride from hand or Grave. Is this stuff in Master Duel yet? No, right? No, okay. Letting the opponent do the same. Because I was about to say triple terror top, you can make carry, but like that stuff is not here yet. Any of their monsters, negating the effects of whatever the opponent summoned. And better luck next time, which searches a gold pride on activation, dealing damage to the user. I will say, at the time, uh, when they announced better luck next time, I, I, that's when I thought Gold Sprite might have potential because that card is literally another one of those kind of custom card situations. Like literally, I remember, I remember when the first wave of Gold Sprite came out, I was like, uh, they need a consistency card that also loses them life points to get them started, right? And this thing just does exactly this, right? Rhoda plus lose the life points is insane. 
Like that that was actually a very promising card at the time. And I mean it did the deck did do some stuff after this release, right? The, the deck was playable. So it's not like it was a failure. I think Gold Pride can be looked at like a, I think it was a successful um design. Like it was I mean it wasn't tier 0, but it doesn't have to be, right? It was a playable deck. That's enough, I think are equal to that monster's attack, drawing one when the Gold Pride extra deck monster tags out once per turn. Yeah. This wave was honestly about everything that Gold Pride needed to stabilize itself, cementing the Punk Engine as part of the deck as it now provided access to your full line thanks to Carrier Carry, also paying life points needed to start the Gold Pride engines. Other noteworthy cards here include- it, You're right, it feels like they tried with Gold Pride. You know, with Tistina, there's no shot they actually wanted it to be good. You can't- they, No, I, I refuse to believe that they sat down and they were like, okay, how do we make Tistina's good? And then they came up with that. There's no shot. No shot. It's Sakatama, a spirit that can reveal itself in hand to normal a spirit from hand in addition to your normal summon that turn. Ringo Worm, a level 2 tuner that can special summon itself from hand if you control a non-effect monster and can banish itself. Man, Ringo Worm is in the same camp as like Assault Synchron. Cards that I think are so cool and I wish they were good. Also, Revolution Synchron, you know, card, like, I, I feel like there has to be some kind of synchro stuff that you can do with those, but it's just not really happened yet from grave if you synchro summon maybe that turn at some to summon point. a level 2 token that can be treated as a tuner chaos angel a level 10 light and dark lock they're very that they're very copium heavy kind of cards chaos angel is i, I think uh are, do you guys like chaos angel or not i like it i'm i'm a fan of the the gameplay it provides i like chaos angel um i think it's fine i think it's like not definitely not too powerful uh because it does have the kind of unaffected thing on it, but I think it's just a matter of just being unaffected by monster effects is fine, I think. Consider a light or dark. I would like if it was cheaper. Well, yeah, okay, I agree with you on that. Yeah, that's fair enough. That's fair criticism. Yep, yep, yep. Dark monster as its tuner. But it is, uh, I, I, I kind of enjoy the, the kind of, the, the design of it. I think it's a well-designed card. Because it's another, I, I... I always tend to, I tend to like extra deck cards that are prim primarily good when going second, right? I like, I kind of like those more than the ones going first. Like the, the Barons and the Savage and the Appaloozas, those kind of cards I don't really love. Um, but I like the, I like the stuff that's like good stuff for going second. On Synchro Summon and gains protections based on the materials used, with Lights protecting your Synchros from all opponents' activated effects and Darks protecting all of your monsters from battle destruction, and Reinforce, a Rescue Ace trap that boosts Rescue Aces by 1500 attack and defense, making it unaffected by the opponent's monster effects and gives it a one-time battle protection that turn. This was another Stinker support card for Rescue Ace. They were like, uh, and then I, I, at that point I thought, okay, Rescue Ace is the, the one that they don't care about off the three, and then we're like, haha, joking, here's Preventer and uh, Emergency. Able to be banished from Grave to reset a Rescue Ace spell from Grave. Just YCS joking. Santiago would be the first testing grounds of this new release two weeks later, but unfortunately we have extremely poor coverage of the event overall with only 11 of the top 32 known to us. One really? of the big breakouts here was, as to be expected, Super Heavy Samurai, taking three of the known 11 slots, notably oh, being able God. to play half their deck as non-engine hand traps due to the raw consistency of the core engine, which was made even easier to start thanks to Super Heavy Samurai Scarecrow, as you could normal summon Soul Piercer, link it off for Scarecrow, and search the combo line that way. Eddie Andre Alba would win the event on Cash Tira. However, unfortunately, he never made his list public, with us only having a record of what he played thanks to Konami's coverage of the event. YCS Philadelphia would be a far more clear showing the following weekend, and with it, we'd see a clear picture of diversity in the meta, with 14 decks in the top 64. Super Heavy Samurai would perform well here, taking 12 top slots and clearing into the top 8, similarly chunking the deck up with various hand trap lines in addition to the Super Heavy Samurai core. Labyrinth would clear in the top 8 as well, claiming 6 hmm. of the top 64, but more notably, a shift had occurred in the deck's composition here, with almost all variants here swapping off of the 20 plus- This is the rise of the Furniture Lab, right? This is the, the time where, like, people started playing the Furniture hand trap version of the deck. ...back row lineup to instead be more centralized around roughly 10 no. traps and a suite of the Furniture Labyrinth pieces, coining the deck as Furniture Lab. This variant would move from here to become the primary variant appearing in future events, being far less susceptible to the previous lab counters like heavy back row removal. Branded had added Quem to their monster lineups, but beyond that, nothing had really changed from Syak's release, Bench. with the deck only clearing into top 32. Pearly, now with a reliable way into X Pearly Noir on turn one, had four players clear into the top cut here, though none made it past top 32. The consistent access to delicious memory now meant that they could make their towers on turn one far more reliably thanks to Plump's attach effects. Gold Pride managed to take two top spots thanks to their second wave of support, God. with one pure variant using various rank three enablers like Tour Guide and Ready Fusion, and one punk variant, even going so far as to play Dark Spirit's Mastery for access to Ogre Dance, which in turn accesses the entire punk side of the deck, which now could access the entire gold pride side of the deck too, being a cavalcade of search cascades. 
Dennis Nottis would take the event on Kashtira, notably having trimmed the deck's Kashtira count down to 8 monsters and 10 spell traps, leaving the rest of the deck for non-engine to counter out the other popular options. This would lead into the next deck building set the following week, and though we've grown used to these sets being sleepers for the past few years, this one would give a bit of pause to that concept. Wait, what did this have? It had the, the dinosaur support? Oh! Wild Survivors. Oh, Vanquish Soul, dude! Oh, my love. Release date, June 1st, 2023. Set type, deck building set. Major strategies, Transcendosaurus, Vanquish Soul, Nouvelle. I will say, uh, even though I like Vanquish Soul a lot, I this is probably one of contender for one of the worst sets of the year. It's not the worst, but literally outside of Vanquish Soul, there's nothing here. And the the I think the most outrageous thing about this set was the the rarity distribution. The rarity distribution was actually outrageous because they knew that the only good one was Vanquish Soul, but they 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 would I I never thought they would go as far as to going to putting seven Vanquish Souls in the ultra rare spot. Like god damn, that was a miserable decision. At Impact three hundred dollars for a tier two strategy. Yeah, Wild Survivors was the second of the deck building set releases this year, and at this point, deck building sets had established a trend of sorts. With practically any release of a deck building set, you'd have one strategy that was playable in the meta directly out of the box to varying levels of success, with at least one other strategy from the set picking up steam after a core release to bring them more support. We'd seen it with Grand Creators between Adventure Punk and Exo Sister. We'd seen it with Tactical Masters between Runic and Labyrinth. We were even seeing it live at the time with Amazing Defenders. Oh yeah, look at this, like uh, Runic Lab. Adventure, Exosister, Punk, Mikanko, Rescue Ace, Pearly. What the hell of a trend? And then there's Valens, like, in the corner crying. But, like, all of these are literal meta YCS winning strategies. Almost all of them. May even may may Probably all of them. Like, Punk, Adventure has won a YCS. Exosister has won a YCS with Raymond I. Uh, yeah, like, all of this stuff is, is incredible. Except for Valens between Mikanko, Pearly, and what was about to be Rescue Ace. However, with Wild Survivors, that trend appeared to be on its way out. And then you have this thing, you know, you Vanquish Souls like tier two at best, and then the other two is just like not viable at all. Very clearly from how the set was even printed, even we were only run. looking at one strategy here being a standalone potential meta deck. Vanquish Soul was that strategy, a series of fire, earth, and dark monsters that all have effects that require you to reveal one or more attributes in your hand for a specific effect themed after button combos you'd have to input for fighting games. These include Raisin, a fire warrior that searched- I just want one more consistency card for a Vanquish Soul. That's all I want, man. I just want the one more card that gives me Raisin access is all I want, man. A non-warrior Vanquish Soul on summon so could reveal close. a fire to become immune to effect destruction that turn and could reveal a fire and dark to destroy all other monsters in its column. Pantera, an Earth Beast Warrior that could summon itself if you have no monsters in your main monster zones, could reveal an Earth to make itself immune to battle destruction, and could reveal an Earth and Fire to destroy all spell and traps in its column. Heavy Border, a Dark Machine that can summon itself from hand by bouncing a non machine Vanquish Soul, could reveal a Dark to draw a card, and could reveal an Earth and Fire to burn the opponent for 15. Dr. Madlove, a Dark Fiend that searches a Vanquish Soul spell trap on summon, could reveal a Dark to drop an opponent's attack and defense by 500, and could reveal a Dark and Earth to bounce the lowest defense monster on field to hand. Pluton HG, a Fire Zombie that can summon itself if you control. <laughs> uh. No monsters or only Vanquish Souls in the main monster zones, could reveal a Fire to boost itself by 3,000 defense, and could reveal a Dark and Earth to boost itself by 3,000 attack. Caesar Valius, an Earth Dragon that can bounce a non Dragon Vanquish Soul to hand to summon itself, could reveal an Earth to make itself unaffected by opponent's effects, and could reveal an Earth, Fire, and Dark to destroy a card on field. Rock of the Vanquisher, a Link 1 requiring a Vanquish Soul monster, locks the opponent to only attacking the strongest monster on field, and can either special summon a Vanquish Soul from hand or occur one from. Literally every Link 1 in the game should have cannot be used as Link material. Change my mind. You can't change my mind. Brave to hand once per turn. Stake your soul. <laughs> a spell that reveals a monster in hand to summon a Vanquish Soul with the same attribute but different name from deck. Bouncing it in the end phase. Dust Devil. A quick play spell that can swap the battle position of a Vanquish Soul to flip an opponent's monster's face down up to the number of different Vanquish Soul monsters you currently control. And continue. A quick play spell that pays 500 to either special summon a Vanquish Soul from Grave and Defense or add it back to hand. If the strategy seems a bit complicated, it is at first. But quickly, Vanquish Soul players figured out optimal lines based on what attributes they open, spawning a popular tier 2 to rogue level pick. The main issue lied in two factors. Number one, its performance in the OCG could not be easily translated to the TCG due to the lack of Maxi in our format, meaning that Vanquish Souls needed a different, reliably accessible Earth monster to run in their deck to fill out that reveal slot, as the fire slot was already filled. It's not only about the having the attribute to reveal kind of thing; it's also just about the the pace that Maxi creates. Right, Vanquish Soul likes to play at a slow pace or like slow-ish pace, right, slower than other decks, uh, and Maxi facilitates that a lot. Right, the, the Vanquish Soul is not bad into Maxi, <clears throat> uh, and other decks are obviously worse into Maxi than Vanquish Soul is. 
sleep by Ash Blossom and Kurikara, which some players would fill with Kashtira Fenrir and Ghost Spell in Haunted Mansion. Number two, for some ungodly reason, the 10 ultra rare slots in this pack, which were usually divided 3, 3, and 4 yeah. between the different archetypes nah, of the set, man. were not this time. As Wild Survivors had given seven slots to Vanquish, seven, Soul, meaning man. that the mid-tier deck was roughly $300 for just the core, causing a backlash in the community due to a blatant upping of the rarities, noting that the other two archetypes present were simply just not as good. Speaking of, Tracindosaurus was the second of these archetypes, a series of retrains for vanilla dinosaur monsters from the past, such as Frostosaurus getting Glacialsaurus, Megazaller getting Gigantazaller, and Lansfornicus getting Jolinathus, but most of these would see little to no play at all in the competitive space. However, two other cards from the archetype here would see play, being Xeno Meteoris, a level 6 dino tuner that could summon itself from hand if a card is destroyed, and can destroy a dino on field or in hand to summon a normal dino from hand or deck. And You say these saw play, yet I don't remember, I mean, I, I, I know it's a playable card, but I don't remember ever seeing this card being played, like, not in a feature match, not, like, uh, not against me, not at a table next to me, uh, not at freaking table 500, I don't remember, like, actually. Ground Xeno, a spell that adds a dinosaur normal or tuner monster from deck to hand, then pops a card in your hand, able to be banished from grave to fuse monsters on field or in hand into a dinosaur fusion monster. These two would be splashed into various dinosaur decks following release as enablers for the baby pops and a searcher for Scrap Raptor, one of the key dino combo pieces. Lastly, Nouvelle was a series of warrior and beast warrior rituals <laughs> focused on tributing attack position- I have the biggest flashbacks from the freaking ritual festival when I see Nouvelle cards. Dude, get these out of my face, man. Oh God, dude. They would literally, they would somehow manage to play for 15 minutes and then do like 200 damage to you. Oh god, and then you couldn't do anything because everything, every good card was banned in the entire festival. And then next turn you watch them play for five more hours and then they attack you for a thousand or some shit like that. God damn from either field to tack into bigger and bigger chefs <laughs> with their main monster bail grill able to negate and tribute an opponent's forward if summoned yeah, by a new they have to ban all other cards in master duel to make this deck playable and then it still wouldn't be able to kill you in like five turns and can on quick effect tribute an opponent's attack position monster to summon hungry burger from the deck welcome to good burger home of the good burger can i take your order but simply the concept <laughs> of the deck was indeed interesting with an actual built-in reason to play the classic hungry burger but due to their nature as ritual monsters and the clunkiness of requiring the opponent to play into them to get their true value nouvelle was not meta in the slightest on release reprints here included uct misc soul eating over raptor baby sarasaurus petita pterodon fire formation tanky lithosagem the incantation monsters archosaur econ double evolution pill fossil dig allure pre prep lost world deck yeah, not a really not a very good set overall i don't know why but they never really seem to put very good reprints into the into the deck building sets like i don't know why that is like if you realize your the three archetypes aren't as good like only vanquish soul is good just just chuck in a couple good reprints instead of making like seven vanquish soul ultras dude dev eradicator and teak boo four days later on june 5th the june 2023 fan list would take effect which extremely notably was dropped during round two of ycs philadelphia <laughs> <laughs> newly banned not Cyberstop only that not only that, this was also this was also the freaking uh, Master Duel Worlds Grind weekend. You guys remember that shit? Like I was sitting here losing my mind because I was playing Master Duel for seventy two hours straight, and they drop a freaking ban list, and I'm sitting here like this in my freaking chair, right, playing Master Duel for like twenty hours straight, being tired as shit, and that's when they're like, "Oh, yo, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna ban a Rysart right fucking now, man." God, a damn. necessary ban due to all the FTKs present from this one card, from Valance to now Super Heavy Samurai, all able to FTK with a single card thanks to this. Number eighty nine, Diablosis, the Mine Hacker. Oh no, this wasn't was even the Rysart ban list. This was the Diablosis. Age one. to cause problems in Kashtira specifically, the enabler of the Shinger era turned one lockout. Super Heavy Samurai Scarecrow, a massive hit to the new meta presence, which heavily limited how consistent the deck could start its play lines by effectively removing their ability to search the combo. A Pointer of the Red Lotus, which was being used to snipe out hand traps and was a bit of an issue card, and Branded Expulsion, which was only being used at this stage to lock out players from playing the game with its various summon targets. Newly limited were Kashtira or Rysart, meaning you only have to oh, out it once. Right, I remember the they limited a Rysart. Right. They, I, 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 forgot about that step that they thought was reasonable to take lock math mech circular the one card <laughs> Ooh, this was only little did we know chat little did we know this was only step one hard combo troublemaker that was too consistent for its own good but was still playable due to being searchable by cards like Cynet mining cyframe gear gamma one of the most annoying hand traps to play against in the meta pearly delicious memory which while not a very big hit on paper absolutely killed pearly's consistency on turn one as now you couldn't reveal three delicious off of Delicious Memory was the kind of hit that if you didn't play a lot of Pearly, it may have not seemed the most impactful to you. Because 
I when I saw this the first time, I hadn't been playing much Pearly at the time yet. Uh, I thought this was not the most important memory because it wasn't even one of the ones that you could activate on an open board, right? It need you need a monster on the board to even activate it. So I was like, why is that that big of a deal? Um, and it's not the it's not the happy memory for the OTKs or the whatever. Like, but the 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 fact that this is the one that makes plump is something that you you realize once you play Pearly how important that is. My friend. Naturia Sacred Tree, absolutely obliterating Naturia. They, this, I, I'm still mad about this, by the way. To this day, they had they had no business limiting Sacred Tree. They, they had literally they, they went too far. I'll say it. They went too far. The runic out of the meta by limiting their searches to game to once per duel effect. No shot. And the return man. of Blaster and Denglong, two cards that have been on the list for quite some time. With Blaster being the second worst ruler after Tempest, and Denglong being previously a synchro combo piece that ended on a search for nine pillars as an Omni Negate. But with the Roradon band was not nearly. I was scared of Denglong at the time. But it turned out to be just not a problem. I played against Sword Soul with Deng Long at German Nationals. Uh, and then after that, I wasn't scared of Deng Long anymore. Problematic. Newly semi-limited were Kashira Unicorn, hits to the deck's best starting monster. Lightning Storm, hits to the best generic board breaker. Runic Fountain, being a slap on the wrist for Runic. We've suffered enough. You guys know we've suffered enough, right? You guys know that. Nick. Sprite Starter, a small hit to Sprites to keep them from rising into the meta with a weakened Kashtira, and Herald of the Orange Light and Engage, both up from one. With Herald yeah, don't call it a slap on the wrist, by the way. It's a soul-crushing defeat that we've taken on this day. Like, don't sugarcoat it, man. It's been rough. ...being released due to the Ishizu names all being limited and engaged due to upcoming Sky Striker support. Lastly, unlimited were Steam the Cloak, Birdman, Recital Starling, Samsara Lotus, Quick Fix, Draco Faceoff, and Multiroll, all being either list cleanup or buffs to decks with support coming down the line. This particular ban list, going into the national season, was a weird one to say the least, hitting both Pearly and Super Heavy Samurai before they even had a real chance. True! This was unprecedented, I mean not unprecedented, but like, the this was super, super fast. They dealt with Super Heavy Samurai really, really fast, which, I mean, I think it was good. I think um, certain, because <laughs> one thing you guys have to realize, and I'll, I'll tell you why this is a good thing, right? The Most of these cards are being designed by the OCG people, right? OCG Konami is designing a large portion of the Yu-Gi-Oh cards, right? And like, um, they are designing a lot of cards with Maxi in mind. You can clearly tell that certain cards are being designed in a way where they're like, okay, um, this strategy is very special summon heavy. It doesn't really have a plan B. It cannot run called by and cross out. That was a big deal for super heavy, right? Super heavy could not really out maxi outside of gamma. If you just waited until they had a monster on the board, they couldn't really out maxi except for Ash, right? Um, and so like this deck was clearly designed to be super combo heavy, super strong, uh, and only be limited in its power by maxi right and like um freaking super heavy samurai still performed really well in the ocg right but sometimes like the tcg has a different mentality on things like that on maxi maxi is banned here for a long time the tcg clearly doesn't want these things to exist in the first place we don't want to have we don't want to play the game of hey you can play a deck that special summons a thousand times but we have maxi in the game so sometimes i just beat you you know like we don't have that kind of gamba mentality here uh, at least the Konami, you know, I mean, blessed be their be their souls, you know, thank God we don't. Um, they just got rid of it because they were like, okay, this deck was clearly designed for the OCG environment. This is not this is not well suited for the TCG. We're gonna get rid of it. And that's it was very based that they that they did that very fast. Right? And that's why they made this stuff common as well, I think. Or super rare, or whatever it was. The the the, the new super heavy samurai stuff was cheap because they, they knew they were gonna murder it. Because it was not, it was not made for the TCG. Chance to shine and hitting the most annoying aspects of Kashtira, but not enough to keep it from being the arguably best deck in the format. The first real test of the meta would be the Central America WCQ held less than a week later, and right off the bat, it was clear that the hits were not enough to knock Kashtira off its throne, taking 14 of the top 64, simply adapting the extra deck and moving on with its life. Sprite would be the more interesting breakout here, thanks to its pivot towards more supplemental engines. They're so faced, man. With Carlos Mikado taking the event with Life Twin Runic Sprite, mixing the various level 2 engines together to form one cohesive strategy. Vanquish Soul would have a solid first appearance, with three players clearing in the top 64, with a top out. The fusion destiny period was wild. Being top 8. 
Notably, playing a couple more generic tools in their lineups to flesh out the attribute count, like Fenrir and Ghost Bell for your Earths, Ash Blossom and Kurikara for your Fires, and one player even using the DP Inge engine to up their dark count. This would be the official start to the national season, with one more set release between here and the remaining WCQs, and judging by the set list, it wasn't going to change much, but it might hold some surprises for later. Probably not impactful if you have to start with this kind of card. What is it? Main set? Oh, Battle Battles of Legends. Battles of Legend. <laughs> Duality, surely no impact, right? Monstrous Revenge. Release date, June 22nd, 2023. Set type, import, reprint. Major strategies, Synchron, Hero, Chaos. Impact, a couple of meta sleepers. Monstrous Revenge would be an important set for the year, not because of what it brought, but for what it started. With the release of Monstrous Revenge, the 25th anniversary celebration. I mean, this set is literally Assault Synchron and Duality. I was mainly excited for Assault Synchron, and then I'm I'm still I'm still sad about Assault Synchron. That card is so cool. I, I it's good. If I, trust one day, one day, copium, copium, copium. Of oh, Azalea, again, right. Primarily punctuated by the inclusion of the new quarter century secret rare rarity into all sets for the next year, being placed onto both new cards and reprints within the set. As for new cards, Assault Synchron would be the talk of the town on release, love, being a level two tuner that can summon itself from hand by burning the player. For this thing was like fifty bucks on presale, and then now it's like five or not even. <laughs> God, it will vanish itself from grave when a dragon synchro is tributed to revive it. While not staple, a soul synchron would be a piece that was heavily experimented with in various decks, but primarily in sprite adventure brews, as its level 2 nature opened up a lot of avenues for the deck. Elemental hero flame wingman infernal rage, really? Skydive scorcher was right there. Was a fusion of any two differently attributed elemental hero monsters, adds a favorite card from deck or grave to hand on summon, and can be tributed to summon another level 7 or lower elemental hero that can't be normal summoned or set. Is assault synchron not that good? No, assault synchron is a good card. It just hasn't found a home yet, you know. Uh, like in the in the OCG, it was extremely good because of Chaos Ruler. Uh, for us, I think it's a very good card. It simply hasn't really like found a home yet. Uh, but I think it could eventually. From either deck or extra deck, ignoring their summoning conditions. While unassuming on the surface, as it really did appear to just be another search to weave into hero combos, Infernal Rage solved a massive issue with a recent wave of hero support from Power of the Elements, that being that there were no good wingman fusions for Neo Swingman. This solved not only that issue, but also searched favorite contact- Tell me you're a hero player without telling me you're a hero player. <laughs> Talking about this card more than like two seconds is okay. <laughs> to make no Neo bias Swingman at all on the opponent's turn, meaning now a standard hero combo could make Dark Law, DPE, yeah. and favorite. Hmm, let's analyze what the problem is with this card and why it didn't make hero the top z uh, tier zero threat in the format. Well, uh, it's heroes, man. Contact in the back row to have as an additional <laughs> piece of interaction. Duality and Shadow's Light were both adaptations of Chaz's spells from the GX manga, with Duality able to tag out a light or dark monster for a same typed and leveled target in either extra deck or main deck of the other attribute, also able to banish itself from grave to shuffle a light or dark from grave back into deck to draw one, and Shadow's Light able to target a dark to summon a light from deck or extra with the same type and level, able to be banished from grave to get an additional normal summon of a light or dark that turn, with Shadow's Light being a little too specific and slow, but Duality seeing experimentation immediately and branded as a way to tag out a spent a luber into herald of the arc light reprints here included ibli nessie sigma the punk cards the adventure engine shin buster zeus ip dark hole terraforming d fissure super poly book of eclipse engage with its alt art equation macro and lastly both bestial and lubelian and lady labyrinth exclusively as quarter century secret rares the uh, i think the battles of legends set was pretty good i think they should have put lubelian in there as a regular secret rare as well maybe and then it would have been pretty fire South American WCQ would be held the same weekend, and though we do have some results here, this particular event is not very well covered, with 41 of the top 64 being unknowns. Vanquish Soul would have a fairly successful outing with 6 of the known 23 top spots, clearing up the top 8 and cutting the non-engine down substantially in terms of, tops, of other dude. attributes, though it was playing a small Kashtira engine to access a Rise Heart for the extra power. Mathmech would see a couple of surprise tops here, with one leaning into the Spirit Engine to access Alan Bershon quickly, and the other leaning into the Firewall pieces for Neo Tempest Terahertz pushes. Santiago Marin would take the event on Kashtira, similarly playing the Slim Down Engine to make room for plenty of non-engine interruptions and search power. The EU WCQ would follow a week later, and unsurprisingly, Kashtira would once again take its spot as the top deck of the format with 15 top spots. Very notably, however, was the rise in various decks thought to be on the lower end of power having shockingly powerful- Why is there four Rikas, man? What are we doing? Performances here. Specifically in Rika, Dragonlink, Flu, and Furhire. Furhire managed to mix itself quite well with the Runics, as most of its pieces could get you. Yeah, I was uh, I was surprised you didn't include this like in the YCS London one because it got top four. That's where it came from. Access to Dawn or Dagger for Hire, 
which provided both destruction and board flooding with its effects, useful for establishing a control setup, and doubly so with the added in sprite package, with Gigantic able to access the fur higher side of the deck through Rex. Flu found itself consistently bouncing in and out of top cuts throughout the year, primarily in a single slot spot, but while it was unassuming, the deck had a layer of consistency to it, able to counter out various decks in the format by both playing into and using macro effects easily, meaning it had a solid matchup into Kashtira specifically as the macro effect of a Rise Heart was not an issue. Dragon Link was rising back into the meta rather rapidly thanks primarily to Bestial Dispater, able to recur the dragons you banished for your Bestial. This was one of those decks where you would just go into the event and you were like, okay, I'm gambling against cash tira right like, i'm like my matchup is good against everything else against cash tira i'm gambling like if i don't have my dark ruler my talents my book of eclipse or whatever i lose it, it, it is what it is summons to provide even more board swarming to get quick and easy access to boral and dragon Rickus on avalon though was the breakout star of the event piloted to a first place finish by jessica robinson showcasing the resilient power of Ricka and sun avalon when played together especially with the extra interaction points provided by con con and the theory on cards the Oceana Championships would be held the same day, and we'd see similar results to the EU WCQ with a couple of notable exceptions. Pearly, fresh off its loss of Too Delicious Memory, topped here not once, but four times, with one pilot taking the deck as far as second place, opting to max out all the remaining quick plays for ease of access to the monster line. Kun Kun Lee would take the event on Kash Tira, playing a fairly standard line up to what we've expected at this stage. The NAWCQ would wrap up WCQ events for the year a week later, and once again Kashira would dominate, taking the event piloted by Jeremy Mitchell, with the deck almost entirely standardized at this point, only varying in the non-engine play. This was four cash in top four, right? Probably the most talked about deck outside of this though was Hero, which took one spot in the top 32 here, sporting the new Wake Up, Infernal Rage, and Neo <laughs> Okay. Swingman packages, letting the deck reliably set up a turn one board comparable to Cash Tira's. No other interesting decks that popped anywhere in the world, but the heroes? Ooh. This would be the last event before this year's World Championship. But no prior bias. to that, the third core set of the year would be given to us, and any hope of a meta shakeup before Worlds would entirely rest <laughs> no, on No, I'll allow it. It's fine. Be biased all you want. Duelist Nexus. Release date, July 27th, 2023. Set type, core set. Major strategies, Synchron, Illusion, Unchained. Impact, the start of a new era. Duelist Nexus, on the other hand, was like, uh, I feel like, at least looking back, I didn't think it was going to be as impactful as it was because it was very, very good. Um, but like, yeah, it was interesting. Well, technically, Duelist Nexus is Looking not back, it has a any. lot of really good stuff in it. Era starting point, as no new show or summoning mechanic accompanied it, the shift in the pack's design layout, as well as its nature as a green pack, heavily implies that Duelist Nexus the is the green start pack of the eighth era of broken. Yu Gi Oh! And as such, it does one thing that a few previous eras have done introduce a new monster type. That would be the Illusion type, based on the various custom monsters from the older non Yu Gi Oh! Yu Gi Oh! games like Dark Duel Stories, with the first archetype of these being tied into Yu Gi's original monsters of Gazelle, Burfamet, and Kai. Do we like Illusions chat? I think Illusions are cool. I kind of like it. It's just, it, it doesn't have much yet, right? But I kind of think the, I kind of I get behind it. I think it's cool. Chimera. This initial wave gave us Gazelle, the King of Mythical Claws, who can add a level 5 Fiend or Chimera Fusion to hand on summon, searching an Illusion monster sent to Grave for a fusion, Big Wing Burfomet, who searches a level 4 Beast or Chimera Fusion to hand on summon, and summons an Illusion monster from Grave when used as fusion material, Cornfield Kotal, sharing a common effect with its other illusions in this group of not being able to be destroyed or destroy others in battle, can discard itself to search for a I mean, that's just what every illusion card has, right? That's that's the whole point, right? It's because they're not real. They can't they can't kill anything, but they can't get they can't be killed, right? If they ever make an illusion that can't be destroyed by a battle, I'll be disappointed. I'll be mad. Monster that mentions Chimera Fusion and can banish itself from Field or Grave while you control a I monster said, okay. named Chimera the Flying Mythical Beast, whom we'll refer to as the OG Chimera from now on, to negate and destroy an effect. There is one? that targets a card you control, Mirror Sword Knight, with the same God battle effect, it. contribute itself to summon a monster from deck that mentions Chimera Fusion, and can banish itself from Field or Grave while you control the OG Chimera to negate a monster effect, Chimera the King of Phantom Beasts, a fusion of a beast and a fiend whose name becomes the OG Chimeras on Field and Engrave, rips a card from the opponent's hand and begins phase its fusion summon, and can banish itself from Grave on the opponent's turn to revive a beast, fiend, or illusion monster, Chimera the Illusion Beast, a fusion of the OG Chimera and one or more illusion monsters whose name becomes the OG Chimeras on Field and Engrave, can attack monsters up to its number of fusion materials, has the same battle destruction prevention effect, and if it attacks a monster, drops that monster's attack to zero and negates its effects at the end of the damage step, and Chimera Fusion, a quick play fusion spell requiring the use of a beast or fiend, and can, during your main phase while it's engraved or you have the OG Chimera on Field or Engrave, can either add itself back to hand or can banish itself from Grave to summon the OG Gazelle and OG Burfamet from Deck or Grave. Where to begin with this wave? If Illusion wanted to make an impactful first wave, this was the way to do it. Not by making it powerful on its own, but by latching itself to a currently meta deck. Because Gazelle searches any illusion monster when used as fusion material and was a beast, it meant that Branded Fusion could send it for Renbrum, allowing you to make a full Chimera push off of Branded Fusion. Branded Chimera was kind of cool. I kind of I like that deck. 
it's never been I, I don't think it's ever been tier one but it was a it was a cool kind of thing which will become a popular option come the next ycs synchron and the 5d's dragons in general oh will get a nice i was new looking forward to, this is another assault synchron situation to me i was so sure that you can do something with revolution synchron slash assault synchron and it just hasn't happened yet i i love revolution synchron that card is so dope man wave support and revolution synchron who can be used crimson dragon is a criminal though on the other hand arrest that thing from hand a synchro summon for a level seven or eight dragon or power tool monster and can mill a card while engraved and you control a level seven or higher synchro to summon itself and make itself level one and crimson dragon a level 12 synchro that can search a spell trap that mentions it on synchro summon and can i mean it's not really crimson dragon's fault to be fair it's more like a calamity issue i would say on a quick effect target another level seven or higher synchro summon on field to return itself to the extra deck and summon a dragon synchro of the same level treating it as a synchro summon revolution and crimson would both be slotted into various decks that liked synchro summoning as revolution provided large amounts of extension and crimson allowed you to double up on desired levels of monsters on the opponent's turn such as by targeting a Barone to summon Dispater, or a level 12 to summon King Calamity. Monodium's second wave would come here in Torrid, with the same special summon effect and floated into any of the Monodium tuners, as well as more Vsauce general support like Verda Kalanta, who can summon itself if the card is destroyed by a card effect while you control Vsauce, Ooh. searching clear new worlds when it does, and can pop a monster the opponent controls when a card you control is destroyed by a card effect, gaining attack equal to its original attack, and Vsauce Amritara, a level 8 synchro that can be made with all tuners whose name becomes Vsauce this Starcross on field, searches a spell trap that mentions Vsauce on synchro summon, and can pop a monster you control to boost all synchros you control by 800. Vsauce and Torrid specifically would find their way into Monodium builds, giving a large boost of consistency through a synchro pool to back up its already powerful search engines from all of the various Vsauce field spells. Infernoble will receive a couple of important pieces in Riccardetto, who can banish himself from hand to summon a level 4 or lower Fire Warrior from oh, hand I didn't as know a tuner, he was that new. and can summon a level 4 or lower Fire Warrior from Grave on summon. Turpin, who allows its equipped monster to be used as a tuner, can special summon itself from hand or Grave if you have a monster being used as an equip card, and can equip itself from Grave to a Warrior monster. I thought these were old ass cards. I thought they only got the new charm. Angelica, a level oh, 5 synchro that can add that. a Horn of Oliphant, or a card that mentions Emperor Charles from deck to hand on summon, can send a Fire Warrior from deck to Grave when targeted for an effect or an attack to temporarily banish herself and summon a Roland monster from deck or extra deck. Emperor Charles the Great, a Link 1 requiring specifically Infernoble Knight Emperor Charles, gaining its effect on this was a pretty cool way to make a link one happen because it wasn't really a link one kind of thing it was kind of like i really liked this design because it was like they realized okay infernoble knight emperor charles is still supposed to be the end board piece of the deck but it's not really strong enough so we're gonna slap a little upgrade on it we're just gonna give them the option to upgrade it into a link one that has bonus effects on top i think that was really cool summon and equipping the spent charles to itself and was able to send an equip spell from hand or face up field to grave to negate a spell or trap once per turn museum a field spell that boosts all fire warriors <laughs> by 500 attack lets you pay 1200 life to search a noble arms card and can the same turn you use the prior effect summon a noble knight monster from the spell trap zone and all mace activating a different infernoble arms card from deck in its place on activation destroying I, it dude if you asked me how many support cards did infernoble get this year i would have said like two i didn't know they got like six or seven cards in one set self after and if it's sent to grave because the equipped monster was sent to grave, can target a banished or engraved fire warrior and add it to hand. Infernoble support here would be outstanding, bringing more combo potential to the strategy and a new and improved end boss, bringing the strategy back into the metagame. Unchained would receive new support here in Sharvara, who can destroy cards. either a fiend or face down card. I, I remember looking at these before the set dropped, and I, I tried Unchained with these cards, and I was like, that this, uh, these cards feel custom for Unchained, right? I still never expected it to be uh, like as good as it was. Like, I, I didn't think it was going to be, like, freaking tier one or whatever you want to call it. Like, it was very dominant, right? But, like, the cards felt good. Control to summon itself from hand, setting an unchained spell trap from deck when sent to grave. Shayama, who can pop a card you control to pop a spell trap on field, able to revive itself from grave by popping either a fiend or a set card you control. And Lord of Yama, a link to that adds an unchained from deck or grave to hand on summon, and can banish itself from grave when a card you control is destroyed to summon a fiend from hand or grave, then pop a card you control. The small wave would do wonders for the strategy, revitalizing it into a meta Cash mainstay, which just how meta would have to wait for a YCS to see. Rescue Ace would get another couple of cards here to round out the strategy and Preventer, who could summon itself from hand by banishing a Rescue Ace in Grave, yep. can flip an opponent's monster face down on a quick effect if you control another Rescue Ace, and can summon a banished non-level 8 Rescue Ace when sent to Grave, and Emergency, a quick play spell that summons a Rescue Ace from deck in defense, then tributes a Rescue Ace from hand or field, able to be banished from Grave to reset a Rescue Ace trap in Grave. These two did a lot to iron out the brickiness of race, with Emergency getting you more reliable access to either Hydrant or Turbulence, which once again, we'd see with the next YCS. I think uh, I think people don't talk about Preventer enough as like a, in terms of a custom card. This card is fucking broken, man. Preventer enables so many of the shenanigans that they do, like the the recycling, the summoning from Banished. How many freaking different lines they have going first to play around stuff like Nibiru, right? You Nibiru them, and then they go Preventer, Banish, Turbulence, link off Preventer, summon back Turbulence, all that kind of stuff. The fact that it does all that. 
and a freaking book of moon on top of it the, the preventer god damn that card is broken a quick play spell that summons a rescue ace from deck and defense then tributes a rescue ace from hand or field able to be banished from grave to reset a rescue ace trap in grave these two did a lot to iron out the brickiness of race with emergency getting you more reliable access to either hydrant or turbulence which once again we'd see with the next ycs pearly would get another boost in e pearly noir a rank two counterpart to the previous sleepy memory able to another, discard a card yeah. to target up to two opponents cards to bounce them and we don't have to talk the about the, like the these, these are obviously broken we know that then immediately overlay and exceed with the same rank but different attribute from the one you well, have on field onto the noir, not one. the able to then attach material from deck to it this support would revitalize pearly into a viable strategy once again namely in giving another good rank up target for going first thanks to sleepy memory now having a valid target as for the one-offs slept in the air the runic main was a new runic my love able to banish itself and an opponent's monster until the end phase as a quick effect in either your main phase or the opponent's battle phase able to summon a runic token when the opponent adds a card from their deck. Oh, this is still duelist nexus right duelist nexus had so much fire in it god damn well not fire but like you, you know what i mean right i guess you can't say that anymore with all the stuff all the fire support next year to hand being a solid piece of disruption and interaction doubly since its effect would also remove it from the emc allowing you to make more fusions evils are lars is a new generic rank six that can't be targeted by monster effects while it has materials and can detach two materials or just one if the materials are all reptiles or dinosaurs to target an opponent's face what was his name in the ocg why is it called lars what how do you like how is it like lagia dolka and then lars man up card when they activate a card or effect to negate that card's effects that turn being a solid generic rank six for the why did people think this set was bad okay the simple thing that happened was that this set came out when cash tira was still a thing and like there was a lot of powerful decks in the format already cash tira even though the format was diverse cash tira was by far the best deck and everyone was looking at these new decks and they were like okay cash tira is gonna gate keep the shit out of them right doubly so simple for dinosaur strategies Dark Corridor is a search spell for Dark Worlds that also discards a card. Absolutely incredible for the strategy, but unfortunately suffers from being a hard once per turn, limiting its usefulness in a strategy that needs every draw to count. Lastly, Fusion Armament is an instant fusion-like spell for fusion monsters listed on other fusion monsters, being extremely niche but holding its use. Following two weeks later would be the 2023 Yukio World Championships held in Tokyo, Japan, being extremely important in a cultural sense for the game as it was the first time in four years that a Worlds event took place. Also being the first time a Worlds event held a Master Duel section, which various top players Foggers. who didn't quite make the main bracket would play in. With the event being a combination of the TCG and OCG's card pool and ban list, deck selections were far more limited than they had been prior, with a decently balanced top cut focused on a couple of mid-powered decks that we've seen previously. Paul Aronson with Dragon Link would take the World Champion title this year, being the first ever US player to claim the title, showing the resilience of the strategy that would never truly die. This would be followed up by another set just five days later, and it would be an odd one to witness after the events of the last year to say the least. Oh god, dude! The, oh man, I love the salad support, but that said, it, we, you I mean, sometimes you gotta say it. That set was bad. Soul Burning Volcano release date August tenth, twenty twenty three. Set type Duelist Pack. Major strategies Salamangrate, Battle and Boxer, Volcanic. M it's funny because looking back, like into next year. Some of the cards in here are actually pretty useful because a lot of other fire decks use like Sunlight Wolf, so the Ghost Rare is kind of nice. Pyro Phoenix or what? No, Raging Phoenix is the one in here, right? Raging Phoenix is kind of going up because some decks are using it. You know, like it, it's kind of like uh, you know, and the Volcanic cards are also. And I mean, people are starting to talk about those kind of cards a little bit. Maybe it's one of those where like the cards are better like a year down the line or something like that. Packed. Pain can finally rest. Legendary Duelist sets were believed to be retired after the last one was broken apart from Mavens and other releases, so seeing Soul Burning Volcano actually release in the TCG rather than getting similarly broken up was definitely a surprise, bringing support for fire attribute strategies used in the anime. The first of these was Salad, which had consistently been in and out of the meta in the past, so a decent wave of support could potentially bring the deck back in. Fire searches a Salad on summon and can banish itself from Grave when a Cyberus battles to destroy your monster in the damage step. Weasel can summon itself from hand if you have two or more salads engraved, and while engraved, when a salad. I love Weasel. Weasel's my favorite one from the from the new support. I, he's so cool. Salad ritual, fusion, synchro, exceed, or link is summoned to the field. You can put it on bottom of the deck to revive a different salad engraved. Tiger can summon itself from hand by discarding another salad. Can be used as a non-tuner for a fire synchro summon, and can modulate its level by one once per turn. Burst Griffin is a level 8 Synchro that can summon a level 7 or lower Fire from Grave once per turn, reducing its level by that monster's, and if it's Synchro summoned using another copy of itself, summons a monster from your Grave in the next standby phase. Rage and Phoenix is a Fire Locked Link 4 that can search a Salad if summoned using a copy of itself, and can summon itself from Grave when a Fire Why is Burst Griffin so bad, man?
monster is destroyed, gaining its attack. Charge is a quick play spell that can shuffle back two banished or grave fires to summon a third, negating its effects and preventing attacking, or can pop a card on field if you control a ritual, fusion, synchro, exceed, or link fire with an attack different from its original. And revive is a trap that revives a fire in grave and can be banished from grave to- Somehow, like, there's- there are so many Salamangrate spell and traps, yet, like, 90% of them are complete ass. Like, Circle is good, uh, Rage and Roar are solid, the field spell is like, I mean, you kind of have to play it. It's not like a good card, actually. You kind of need it for the, for the deck to work. It's not like a good card. Everything else is just ass, man. Well, Will is fine. Will is okay, true. Will is okay. But like, you know, like, still, there's so many, man. Shuffle a salad and grave with the same name as one on field to boost the field monster's attack by the shuffle monster's attack. More swarming, searching, and recursion is always appreciated for Salad, but this particular support simply just made Salad better at what it was already pretty great at, seeing very little relevant movement in Salad the Salad Angered of Fire should have been level 1? That would have been interesting. From it. Battle and Boxer would receive its first support since the Zexal era with Uppercutter, who searched a Battle and Boxer or Counter Counter Trap on Summon, and when sent to Grave can summon another Battle and Boxer from Grave, or set a Counter Counter Trap from Grave. Chief Second, who let you normal an extra battle inboxer and two extra battle inboxer and warrior or fire monster can summon itself from hand, negate the attack, and banish a monster on field until the end phase. Promoter, who can summon itself from hand if the opponent controls a monster, contribute itself to summon two other battle inboxers from deck, and can banish itself from grave to level modulate all battle inboxers by one. Number C79 battle inboxer General Kaiser, a three mat rank five that gains 200 attack for each material it has, can attach to the negate a special summon the opponent performs, and if it has no Kaiser as material when attack is declared involving a battle inboxer and an opponent's monster, you can send a battle inboxer from hand or deck to grave to absorb the opponent's monster's material. King Dempsey, a rank four that searches or dumps a level four lower oh, fire warrior pretty. or battle inboxer spell trap, and can attach a material on a quick effect to prevent targeting battle inboxers with card effects for the rest of the turn. Seventh force, a quick play spell that when a monster is destroyed in battle phase. Targets a number exceeding grave and summons a number C from the extra deck that is one rank higher, attaching the targeted monster as material. Then able to search a seventh variance or rank up magic spell trap from deck to hand if you summon a 101 to 107 monster this way. And cross counter a counter trap that negates a monster effect and destroys it by destroying a battle and boxer or number monster you control. Then summons a battle and boxer exceed from extra deck with a different name, attaching cross counter as material. While this support would be great for the archetype, battle and boxer has not been anywhere near meta relevant, even back in the Zexal era. And this support wouldn't change that fact. Although notably, King Dempsey being generic meant it could be used with other decks that would want a low level fire warrior search, like Vanquish Soul or Infernoble. Lastly, Volcanic received its first wave of support since Accelerator Reload. I actually like the volcanic cards. I don't know if they are ever gonna see play. Uh, like it's it's one of those situations where I I like the cards, but I don't know where they're gonna see play or if. But I like the Odin volcanic of eternity all the way back in 2015, and it would get a decent support wave for the archetype itself. Rimfire, when sent to grave, can banish itself from grave to dump another volcanic. What is this or music? It's too loud. Well, it's the background music of the video. I can't do anything about it. From field to grave to place a different blaze seems accelerator to me. card from hand or deck face up on the field. Trooper can search a volcanic card on summon and can discard a card to summon a bomb token to the opponent's field, burning the opponent for 500 when destroyed. Emperor must be special summoned from hand or grave by banishing three pyro monsters or a blaze accelerator from field or grave, burning the opponent for 500 for each banished pyro on summon and setting a volcanic trap from deck, burning the opponent for 500 each time they special summon while he's on field. Volcanic blaze accelerator was a continuous spell that could be activated by dumping a blaze accelerator from hand decker this card specifically is very nice because it's like uh the only the only bad thing about this card is that you have to play the blaze accelerator in your deck but other than that this card just pops an opponent's monster and foolishes a freaking volcanic field to grave can summon a volcanic from hand once well, a per level turn, one pyro. and can pop an opponent's monster by dumping a level one pyro from deck to grave fire ejection can send a pyro from deck to grave then if it's a volcanic you can either burn the opponent for its level times 100 or summon a bomb token to the opponent's field emission was a trap that can either search or summon a volcanic monster ignoring its summoning conditions returning it to the hand in the end phase or burn the opponent for either the attack of their monster or half the attack of your monster and inferno was a continuous trap that could banish a pyro from grave when the opponent activates a monster effect on field to burn the opponent for 500 and negate the effect if you banish the volcanic and can place up to two banished or grave volcanics on the bottom of the deck the opponent's end phase. The support would be solid in revitalizing the volcanic strategy into a competent burn strategy for casual play, with Emperor having a similar role to Masquerade from the branded Despia deck, but would be nowhere near enough to make the deck a standalone meta threat. This left the pack just as quickly forgotten as it was before it came out, with the new set coming a month later to bring some levity to the price ceiling of the game as a whole. Dueling Heroes Release date, September 7th, 2023. Set type, reprint set. Major strategies. What the hell is dueling heroes? The relevant cards of 2022. Impact, lowering the price of tier two plus strategy. Dueling heroes? Omega tins. Oh, Megatins. Okay, I, I was Dueling like, Heroes would be this oh, year's okay, Megatin, okay, okay. and as expected, would reprint various good strategies from 2022, reprinting the archetypes of Livermancer, Dinomorphia, Therion, Scareclaw, Exosister, Bistial, Blackwings, Kashtira, Draco Slayer, Labyrinth. Ru the tins, I like the tins looking. I mean, the tin, I think the tins were good. I think it, it was a little bit overshadowed by the fact that they left out, um, they left out sprites. 
Kurikara and specifically like Pearl of Rhino from Tier Limits, right? That was the one that every that was the cards that everyone was complaining about, right? Outs I mean, they still had a, a, a huge amount of good reprints. I still think I, I still look good tins. Runic I and Adventure. It. In addition to the standalone cards of Illusion of Chaos, Machinex, the Zombie Vampire, Alba Linatus, Pep. I mean, that's a lot of good fucking stuff in here. You know? Beyond the Pendulum and Blazing Cartesia. For the most part, these reprints weren't very relevant to the current metagame outside of reprints of Fenrir and Unicorn, but were still appreciated for dropping the price ceiling a little bit. YCS Vancouver would be held the same weekend on September 8th, and with this being- A Rise Heart still wasn't banned when Unchained was taken over? Really? I forgot about that. I thought, I thought a Rise Heart was already gone. In the first YCS post Dune, the meta had been substantially shaken up by the results here. For starters, Kashira had fallen from its prior pedestal, dropping all the way to fourth in comparison to its competition. Pearly would rise to a comfortable space in the meta with the release of E Pearly Noir, giving the deck a reliable going first exceed target with Sleepy since you do not need to control a monster to activate it. Dragon Link had risen severely in popularity following its world's performance, with more players taking advantage of Dispater alongside the swarming potential of the light and dark dragons. However, the absolute breakout success here would be Unchained, taking nine top spots and winning the event pilot by Jesse Cotton. Once again, right. tying the record for most YCS. All right, because it was just like, it was the Thrust, Eclipse, Talents era and Nib to, to beat Arisard and then it was just good into other stuff and had a, had a lot of good non-engine into, into cash, yeah. Wins at five total, with the new Unchained cards effectively turning the deck into a sort of Fiend box, similarly to how Dragons form Dragon Link, with Tour Guide being a full Unchained line and Dark Contract with the Abyss being a surprise tech choice that would become staple. Y'all remember when people argued about playing Tour Guide, like a literal one card combo in a deck that didn't have one card combos and didn't need its normal summon and people were like yeah i don't i don't think you should play that i don't think you should play this one card that wins you the game like and does full combo on its own and and like you don't need your normal summon anyways I, you don't need it deck providing access to Machinex through Vice King Requiem, giving Unchained the ability to pop their cards to begin their combo lines in addition to being a board breaker going second. Aside from this breakout, a couple of other decks managed to take a top here thanks to the new cards from Doom. Rescue Ace would be the first of these, with Emergency ironing out so many of their starting line issues by giving you access to much of their lines on turn one reliably, with Preventer also providing solid support here too. Infernoble would make it all the way to top eight here thanks to the combo potential of their new support held in combination with Isolt, who could still enable the deck to do absolutely insane plays off of any two warrior monsters. With you know it's not a good infernoble list when it when it's not like 41 of right like you you already know they weren't cooking when they put more than one copy of a card into their deck Geospace Connector and Aqua Dolphin once again appearing as a way to clear out hand traps prior to comboing off. Branded Chimera was the new evolution You're of the strategy Highlander thanks to the new deck. Chimera support, using Gazelle with Branded Fusion to enable a Chimera the King of Phantom Beast line to support the prior Branded play lines. YCS Cancun would be a week later, and with the rise of Unchained into the meta, the balance of power was clearly upset, with Kashtira once again taking the top representation slice, but not by a convincing margin that it had earlier this year, with Unchained right on its heels. Monodium Scareclaw would peek into the meta here with the addition of Elemental Hero Prisma to the lineup alongside a hero lives, to copy Vsauce Starfrost from the deck, enabling easier Wait, access to Vicious Astraloud and Lightheart off of the monster that could potentially not take your normal this one doesn't summon. Play Dinosaur would take a top spot here thanks to Xeno Meteoris, able to extend you further off of your standard dino lines in addition to popping your baby dinos to summon Frostosaurus out of the deck. Oh shit, it did top, but it doesn't even play Ground Xeno. Well, okay. Pairing their effects in Grave, in addition to the ability to trigger Lars multiple times. Andre Curioso would win the event on Fluanderies, taking advantage of the meta centralizing around Kashtira and Unchained to perform its game plan uncontested. Uh, this was never meant to happen, right? This was never supposed... Fluanderies was supposed to be the, the deck that always, like, you know, go, gets second place. I don't know, that was like a... There was a, a crack in the Matrix or something like that when this happened. Tested. This would lead into the next structure deck release a week later, and while it wouldn't be the most impactful, changes were on the way alongside it that were sure to shake up the meta substantially. The Crimson King. Release date, September 21st, 2023. Set type, structure deck. Major strategies, Resonator, Red Dragon Archfiend. Impact, new pieces for Dragon Link. The Crimson King would be the second structure deck release of the year, being focused around the archetypes of Resonator and Red Dragon Archfiend. This deck in itself is not very good. Not like, you know, like Fire King or Trap Tricks make their own deck and are viable strategies. Red Dragon Archfiend is not a viable strategy, but the cards are very splashable. Like specifically uh, Vision Resonator, Crimson Gaia are pretty good cards in other decks. Like you, you they, those can pop up uh, here and there and are like viable uh, pieces. Like there, there's, there's good cards in here. 
Scorch Fiend, providing support to bring them into the modern era. These included Soul Resonator, who searches a level 4 or lower fiend on summon and can banish itself from grave to protect the card from destruction while you control RDA or a synchro that mentions it. Vision Resonator, who can summon itself from hand if you control level 5 or higher dark and searches a spell trap that mentions RDA when sent to grave. Bone Arch Fiend, who can summon itself from hand or grave by sending another card from hand or field to grave and can send a fiend tuner from deck to grave to modulate a monster's level by 1. Crimson Gaia, who searches a card that mentions RDA from deck to hand once per turn, can flip all opponents' monsters into face down defense when an RDA attacks and can summon an RDA from grave when destroyed by card effect. Fiendish Golem, which banishes a 2k or higher attack monster until the end phase, then sets Fiendish Chain from deck if you control an RDA. I thought it was funny that this card searches Fiendish Chain, which was a throwback from like 12 years ago. It or a synchro that mentions it. Red Zone, which pops a card on field when the opponent activates a card or effect while you control RDA or a synchro that mentions it, and can summon a banished Dark Dragon Synchro once per turn. And Scar Red Dragon Arch Fiend, a Dark Walk level 8 synchro whose name is RDA on field and engraved, if sent to grave from the monster zone, summons an RDA from extra deck as a synchro summon, then destroys all attack monsters the opponent controls if it was used as a synchro material. While Resonator would not be a viable standalone option, Vision and Crimson Gaia would be considered as an engine for Dragon Link decks, able yep. to be synced with the level 6 Bestials to access Crimson Gaia to add more copies from deck to hand which in turn can be comboed easily into Dispater. Reprints here include Backjack, Nessie, Chupacabra, Extrav, Fiendish Chain, and King Calamity, being rather light but hitting a couple of key cards. Four days later, the September 2023 ban list would go into effect, Arise aimed at making only a small handful of changes, but aimed to rock the meta to its core with them. Newly banned was Kashtira Arise Heart, yes. completely knocking the longtime threat out of the meta by removing their only good remaining turn one play. Bro, it was here for so long, man. How did they ban Super Heavy Samurai Scarecrow like two weeks after release and let this thing run around for like almost a year, man? Newly limited were Bestial Magnemut and Chaos Space, hits to the world's winning deck of Dragon Link, and heavily changed how the Bestial line could be used moving forward. Lastly, unlimited were Herald of Orange Light and Salomon Great Gazelle, as Orange Light was no longer a This was a fine list. This was this was okay. It was relatively light, but it was it was solid. Threat, and Salad could use more Gazelle to go with their recent support. YCS Dortmund would be the first testing grounds of the new format and How many times do we have to teach you this lesson, old man? <laughs> yeah, <tears back. laughs> here they are. Back at it again. <laughs> The main thing holding back the strategy in the meta was Kashtira's access to a Rise Heart. Yeah, bro, with... there's only one Rika in top 64. Surely they won't win. That removed, the deck instantly shot back into the meta with its varied fusion line access points that can cascade quickly into various Exceed and Link plays. Unchained, now missing its primary threat in the meta, was poised to take over the metagame following Kashtira's hits, but would struggle to take over now that all of the decks that Kashtira had forced out were returning. Dragon Link had once again performed, despite the hits to two of their best cards, adapted by leaning even heavier into the other Bestials for their combo lines. Julius Schwarzkopf would win the event on Rika Sun Avalon, once again showing the consistent power of the genus Loki start. This would lead into arguably the best set release of the year, and with the meta freshly nerfed, this was the perfect state for an absolute upheaval of what remained. Oh god, we're here already. We're already at Age of Overlord? Well, already, dude. It's been like two hours. Age of Overlord. Release date, October 19th, 2023. Set type, Core Set. Major strategies, Snake Eye, Horus, Armored Exceed. Impact, a massive shift to the game as a whole. Age of Overlord would, without exaggeration... This is the, the best set of the year, right? Like, in terms of the rarity collection, in terms of reprints, sure. But like in terms of new cards and meta impact, surely it's Age of Overlord, right? Not even close. Change everything about the meta. Introduce even though you could say, I mean, Fa Photon Hypernova bringing a Rysard was also freaking insane. Like that, that, that stuff was also very dominant for six months or something like that or more. But I think Age of Overlord is going to be more impactful in the long term because it, it's got more like overall good cards, not just one deck, but like, I mean, SP Little Knight and Typhon are going to change the way we play the game for a long time. New archetypes that would be meta-defining, new singles that would be played in everything, and support for previous archetypes that would potentially change their positions in the meta. Exactly what an impactful core set is supposed to do. Much of that would be centered around the newest lore-focused monster, like Albaz and Vsauce before her, being Diabellstar the Black Witch, able to summon herself from hand by sending another card from hand or field to grave, setting a sinful spoil spell trap from deck on summon, and able to resummon herself if sent to the grave on the opponent's turn by sending a card from hand or field to grave. She would also be searchable by Wanted, Seeker of Sinful Spoils, able to add a Diabell. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Uh, I, I think one very, very cool design trait of the Diabellstar package is that it doesn't, it, it benefits a couple different decks, but most, more importantly, it's an engine that doesn't require you to run any sort of bricks, right? It's like the cool thing about it is, yes, it's kind of like you play different pieces that search each other, but you don't like, it's not like one of them is a brick. Like you can, you can start your combos with all three of the cards because the cards that are being played the most is Diabellstar, Wanted, and the Sinful Spoil Snake Eye spell, right? And it's like, no matter which of the cards you draw, the engine works, right? And design-wise, that's really, really cool. My only issue that I have with these cards is the price point, literally. Legitimately, I, I simply, I believe that they should have done a better job uh, because the the freaking engine is like 400 bucks or whatever i i think that's just like it, it's a little bit 
it's just too much, man. It's just too much. They should. I, I I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what they should do. I'm not a freaking Yu-Gi-Oh card marketing expert or anything like that. It's just like you know, the stuff was a lot cheaper at release. That is true. You know, the wanteds. I picked up my wanteds for like forty ish or forty five ish. I don't remember exactly. Um, like it wasn't always that expensive, but it is now, and that also matters. You can't expect everyone to pick up stuff like uh, eight months in advance or like, like exaggerated you know like it, it and it's still even that was expensive star monster from deck to hand and can be banished from grave to place a sinful spoil spell trap that is either banished or in grave on bottom of the deck to draw one because the thing is these cards are not going to be reprinted um before i don't think so i mean possibly of course but like i don't think these cards are going to be reprinted the majority of the time where they're going to be top of the meta right the next couple months they're probably not going to be reprinted they might be reprinted at some point when they're still like tier two, tier one point five. Who knows, right? But like while the while the fire decks are going to be tier one, we're probably not going to see a reprint. She would even be tied to the new archetype of Snake Eye, a series of mostly level one fires with Snake Eyes are really cool. I'm looking forward to actually playing Snake Eyes, who adds a level one fire from deck to hand on summon and can send itself in one other face up card to grave to summon a Snake Eye from deck. Oak, able to recur a graved or banished Snake Eye on summon with the same summon effect. Birch, who can summon itself from hand if you control a fire monster with the same summon effect. Flamberge Dragon, a level eight dragon who can place a monster in grave or on field into the spell trap zone as a continuous spell, can summon a monster being treated as a continuous spell on the opponent's turn, and when sent to grave, can summon two level one fires from grave divine temple of the snake eye a field spell able to place a snake eye monster from hand deck or grave in face up spell and trap zone as a continuous spell on activation boost level one fires by 1100 attack and can summon a monster being treated as a continuous spell when the opponent summons a monster an original sinful spoils snake eye which sends a face up card to the grave to summon a level one fire from deck able to be banished from grave to search a level one fire from deck and place a snake eye or dia bell star from grave on bottom of the deck sinful spoils snake we'll talk about some of the implications when we do once we're done with the recap we're going to do a little bit of an outlook on 2024 uh so we're going to talk a lot more about these kind of cards for now is i i would say at the moment uh as of december 2023 the impact that these cards have had have just been like it's been huge support for rescue ace and also for fire king at this point in time right like it's just been like at this point the only cards that have seen a lot of use are these three on the screen right now as a way to facilitate level one fire access. It's going to go beyond that in early 2024. We're going to get some other stuff that makes you play like bigger packages, snake eye packages in, in a lot of different fire decks, so on and so forth. That, you know, that's just foreshadowing. For now, these have just been insane. Infernoble as well, right? I forgot about Infernoble. Um, but massive boosts in general for level one fire type decks, you know, like anything that played level one fire, like even even Mikanko with um with Renaud, you know, like but it's always been these three cards pretty much, right? Guy, Dia Bellstar, and wanted would become an engine for any deck that needed easy access to a level one fire monster in the format, yep. like Rescue Ace, instantly rocketing Rescue Ace up the meta to far higher levels of success than it had already seen, with the remaining Snake Eye cards holding promise to go with later support. Horus was a new archetype of level eights centralized around the continuous spell King Sarcophagus, which gives Horus monsters non targeting destruction prevention, can send a card from hand to grave to dump. Horus is one of the things where it looks very promising, but I feel like it's missing something, and I'm not sure if it's going to get it. Even the cards that are already announced to release soon. I'm not sure if that's it. They get another consistency card though, which is huge. A horse monster from deck up to four times a turn and can send a monster that the opponent controls that a horse monster battles to grave in the damage step once per turn. All of the horse monsters share the ability to summon themselves from grave when you control King Sarcophagus, with Imseti able to send himself in another card from hand to grave to search King Sarcophagus and draw a card, able to send a card from field to grave when another card you control leaves the field by an opponent's card effect, Duamatef boosting by 1200 attack and defense for each horse monster you control, able to draw cards equal to the number of different monsters in your main monster zone when the opponent removes a card from the field by card effect, Happy, able to either add two banished or grave cards to hand or shuffle them back into deck when the opponent removes a card from field by card effect, and Kevesenuef, who gets all of your horse monsters targeting protection from battling card effects when the opponent removes a card from field by card effect. Lastly, Canopic Protector summons a horse monster from hand or grave when the opponent this activates card is an very effect, cool. able to do it once per This card's very cool, but it's only good in like pure Horus decks, but people are playing it obviously more as like a rank 8 splash for monster name and resets itself when sent from hand or field to grave. These cards form a pseudo engine of sorts for decks that don't mind playing out of the graveyard, as you can use King Sarcophagus to effectively trade your opening hand for a grave of resummonable level 8s, which in turn gives you access to the rank 8 pool's various options, seeing success with decks like Tier. Vsauce and Monodium would get a wave of new cards focused around the Vsauce synergies, but the two most important of the wave came in Vsauce Samsara, able to be considered a Vsauce Starfrost on field and in grave, can summon itself from hand by shuffling back any number of banished, grave, or on field Vsauce monsters, boosting by 400 attack for each different one shuffled, and can be treated as a non tuner for a single. Summon. A Monodium Trisupta, a level 6 synchro tuner that can summon a level 2 tuner from Grave on summon, also negating its effects, and can swap any number of tuners on field to level 2. 
Isn't this also a tuner? Because I think that's the only thing that's holding it back from being broken. I think the, the graphic is a little off, right? Because this is a tuner. Otherwise, it'd be so much better, right? It is a tuner. Yeah, yeah, okay. To that turn, <gasps> locking you into synchros when you do. <sighs> These two would immediately be included <laughs> into the various Monodium pile decks that popped up, which we'll talk about with the next YCS. The Exceed armor line would be a new set of generically splashable Exceeds that play off of each other for advantage generation with Torpedo, a rank 3 that can detach two materials to draw one and gives a monster it's equipped to effect stunning when they attack, and if it's an Exceed targeting protection from effects, Fortress, a rank 5 who can overlay itself onto any other rank 3 or 4, cannot be used as Exceed material unless it has no materials, can detach up to two materials to add an armored Exceed card for each material detached from deck to hand, and gives a monster it's equipped to double battle damage, full armored Dark Knight Lancer, a 3 map rank 7 that can overlay itself onto a rank 5 or 6, boosts itself by 300 attack for each material. These are interesting cards, they just haven't really done anything yet an equip card on it can add an exceed named card engraved to hand once per turn and can when an equip card becomes equipped to a monster you control absorb an opponent's monster to itself as material and full armored exceed a trap that while you control an exceed monster exceed summons using monsters you control and can be banished from grave to target an exceed monster and equip another exceed from field or grave to it as an equip spell with the effects of boosting the equip monster by its attack and can destroy itself to protect the monster from destruction these cards would be extremely generically splashable with any deck able to make a rank three able to use the full line with one copy of full armored exceed in the deck to use the summon dark knight lancer on the opponent's turn using fortress and any deck that can make a rank three or four that can lose all of its materials can do the same line without torpedo with math mech being a particular beneficiary thanks to Alan Bershon. Vanquished Soul would receive a new wave here in Xiaolong, a fire worm that can summon itself as a- Ah, <sighs> Xiaolong. Man. This card, at the same time, was really, really cool for Vanquished Soul. At another time, was also kind of disappointing. So, like, when I, when I played Vanquished Soul for the first time, the deck had two issues. Two more or less heavy issues. The It comes down to consistency because it, it it needs raisin right uh and the other thing is it before jiao long its problem sometimes was just like it's sealing right like sometimes it just didn't have the oomph you know to actually like it didn't feel like even if you had raisin it didn't feel like you were doing anything incredibly powerful you know like people would be able to just break the board and, and kill you or win the game even if you did open pretty much full combo right um and so when I when I read Jiao Long for the first time, I thought it was going to fix the consistency problems because it's a searcher, right? Like uh, surely you 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 would think a searcher gives you the ability to do, to be more consistent. However, I think it, uh, contrary to what I thought at first, it doesn't do that pretty much at all because uh, you really can't use Jiao Long to search Raisin if you don't have Raisin already most of the time because quite simply you're not going to be able to summon this thing and still have two fire monsters in hand uh, to still search a Raisin. That's just not very likely to happen. It's only like uh, it only happens very very rarely that that could happen, right? Yeah, it gives you some more consistency for Stake Your Soul. You have more fire monsters in the deck, yada yada. But the thing that this card does. Um, is it it raises the deck ceiling by a lot because um, Vanquish Soul is the kind of deck that easily cycles through all of the effects in one turn. Like if you have Raisin, you probably are able to cycle through all of the things in one turn. You can draw a card with Borger, search a spell trap with Madloaf, pop a card with Caesar, uh, pop a monster with Raisin, uh, and now search a card with Zhao Long, which just gets it gets it over the top pretty much because now. You add another card on your turn, uh, and then you add another card on your opponent's turn, and now you just have infinite value over the turn. The, the like, you just have everything, right? You have all the attributes, you have all the pieces you need to get all of your Vanquish Soul effects, all that stuff, right? And so, like, that's what Zhao Long does. Like, uh, at first I thought it was going to help consistency, but it doesn't do that pretty much at all. It, it doesn't help consistency because, I mean, most of the break hands, actually, that I've been drawing in Master Duel had freaking Zhao Long in it with no, no way to summon it. Or even if I can summon it, I don't have two fires, right? So, like, um, Zhao Long actually doesn't really help consistency all that much. It's pretty much more like a combo piece that gets the deck over the, like, over the threshold of actually being, like, you know... The, the 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 full vanquish soul opener is now after this set is considered like you can consider it broken like if the if the full vanquish soul combo goes through you have the jiao long in rotation you get the new trap card like that's hard to break like that's a good opener now right so the thing that the deck still needs in my opinion is uh, like a little bit of a consistency piece right just a little bit Vanquish Soul is revealed for a card effect while he's in hand, can reveal a fire to change a monster's battle position, and can reveal two fires to search a Vanquish Soul card, and Snow Devil, a trap that can reveal one of each of Earth, Fire, and Dark in hand to apply effects in sequence. And this card is kind of like a sleeper. Like, this card is not as flashy as Zhao Long, but it's also, I think, incredibly important for, for Vanquish Soul because this is the one 
that in the normal Vanquish Soul end board, this card is what makes it unbreakable. This card is insane. The fact that you have to play around them being able to blow up your board at any point is makes it really hard to play into this deck now. It's not as it's not as this card is much better than the Book of Moon thing that they had in the first set that they came out. Like this card is incredible. Uh, Jane OCG man, I thank you for the five gift subs. Appreciate that. You've been supporting the channel a whole lot this year. Appreciate that so much. Thank you one last time in 2023. Appreciate you. It's based on how many. With one or more burning the opponent for 400 and summoning a Vanquished Soul from hand, two or more burning for 600 and protecting a Vanquished Soul from effect destruction that turn, and three or more burning for 800 and destroying all monsters on the field. This would be a solid wave thanks to Zhao Long filling a very specific hole in the strategy by being the second good fire nay, allowing Stake Your Soul to be a lot more live for the deck in addition to giving Ryzen a better target for its pop effect. Ken the Warrior Dragon and Gen Aww. the Diamond Tiger were TCG exclusives that could summon the other to the opponent's Aww. board, with each having an effect when summoned by the other, with Ken making the opponent draw two and discard one, and Gen discarding a card from your hand. But remember these will be summoned to the opponent's board, so these will be activating for your opponent, meaning in reality it'll make you draw two and discard one, or Aww. your opponent discard a card from their hand. These two nifty little guys do a lot more than they say on the tent, being enabler for decks like Dark World, or much more importantly, for turning on Triple Tactics Talents and Thrust, as your opponent will have activated a monster effect and will currently control a monster, seeing a lot of hype on reveal for those applications. On to the one-offs. Arius the Labyrinth Builder can on a quick effect send itself from hand or field to grave to summon a labyrinth or set a normal trap from hand, making the trap able to activate that turn, and when the opponent- Arias is cool, I like Arias. Opponent responds to a normal trap or labyrinth card can summon itself from grave, giving labyrinth the option to effectively play on turn zero when the opponent is going- King Boohoo, also thank you to five, and King Sora, thank you for the gifts, I appreciate you guys, thank you so much. First, but being limited to what was in the opening hand for options. Burfamet, the mythical king of Phantom Beasts, is a fusion of two different typed monsters between beasts, fiends, and illusions, whose name becomes the OG Chimera on field and engrave, can dump a beast, fiend, or illusion from deck to grave on fusion summon, and can banish itself from grave on the opponent's turn to summon a banished beast, fiend, or illusion, being a solid one of in the already popular branded Chimera build. Super Star Slayer Typhon Sky Crisis is a rank 12 that can overlay onto your strongest. I love Typhon, dude. I love Typhon. Once again, continuing the trend of me liking extra deck monsters that give you more utility going second. I think this kind of stuff is incredibly important for the modern game because it's one way. It's one way to fix the going first problem because like board breakers like Talents or Thrust or Dark Ruler or Droplet or whatever, they can only do so much. And the same is true for hand traps because at the end of the day, you have to draw those cards, right? And I mean, of course, you will draw them sometimes and they do help against combo decks, no question. Um, but having cards like this from the extra deck that are powerful going second uh, is is really one of the best ways to counteract um, broken combo decks going first style type because you don't have to draw a Typhon. Uh, you don't have to, like, you don't have to draw the option to go into a Zeus, de depending on what situation you're in, right? Those kind of things, um, they're always going to be accessible to you, unless you're playing a deck that locks themselves out of it, but that's also part of the balancing of your deck, right? If your deck locks itself out of making a few uh, XCs or anything like that, you know, part of the balancing aspect of the game. But, like, in general, not having to get lucky and draw a card like this is i think it's great i think it's um i think typhon is a phenomenally designed card because the drawback on this card is massive like this card is not unbalanced in the slightest this card is completely fine in my opinion um I, the, the card is is basically once you summon this thing your turn ends right which it, it means it's something you have to use very carefully um and and it's not always live even you know some decks play around it sometimes by not summoning from the extra deck twice but i think that's also fine you know like if someone wants to play around typhon by not summoning from the extra deck even twice then you know fine in my book as well you know like healthy healthy gameplay has been achieved i would say you know so like fine as well i, th I think this card is is, is great I, I love this card probably my probably one of my favorite card designs from the year um overall in terms of in terms of just game design and balancing around it monster the turn or turn after the opponent summons two or more monsters locks you from summoning the remainder of the turn locks the effects of monsters with 3,000 or more attack and can detach a material to bounce a monster from field to hand being very clearly set up as the anti-zeus able to come down and completely counter the popular board wiping threat infernal banshee is a rank four that can detach one to either search or bin a pyro from deck and is able to summon itself if banished while you control a pyro gaining attack equal to the number of your banished monsters times 100 being a generic rank four pyro searcher or dumper for various strategies exceed the pendulum is a rank three requiring a pendulum monster that gains 100 attack for every pendulum bridge, 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 bridge. Bridge, bridge. Hand on link summon, and can special summon a pendulum from hand or grave whose level is between your pendulum scales once per turn in the main phase on a quick effect. Being a critical extension piece for pendulum strategy similar to a previous iteration of Beyond the Pendulum. Angelica's Angelic Ring can only be equipped to a monster that already has an equipped card. The gates this card makes me furious. 
the effects of the first spell the opponent uses. Freaking, oh, he may chain to a spell card to, uh, to equip this, and then, you know, I hate that. That resolves that turn and can pay 500 to destroy it to give its Hard monster good, targeting though. protection permanently seeing play in infernoble is an added control option lastly and unquestionably most importantly sp little knight was a rank 2 that if link summoned using an extra deck monster as material banished a card on field or in grave and could when the opponent activates a card or effect banish two cards on field until the end phase including at least one card you controlled this one link monster um i think sp little knight is the best card printed this year uh, and I don't think it's close. I don't think it's close. Uh, I think it's the best card of the year. I think it's it's cha it's already changed the way we play the game um, for the last couple weeks. And it's going to change the way we play the game moving forward. And like, this card is more impactful, I think, than cards like Baron have been, cards like Appalooza, cards like Nightmares. Like This card is on the same level, if not more um, uh, impactful. Uh, and I, I will say outside of, and this is a big issue. I'm, I'm not, I'm not just pushing it aside lightly. I, I think the price point is, is a big issue with this card, but outside of that, I actually, I'm surprised, but the more I think about it, the more I, I like SP Little Knight, um, outside of the fact that it's pricing out people from the game. And it is, this is one of the cards that is pricing out people from the game actively, because this is not an issue of like, Hey, you can't afford cash Tira. Play a different deck, you know? You can't afford Thrust. Play different non-engine. For a lot of decks in the game, uh, there is no alternative to this card. This card is, is very, very powerful. Like, literally, if you can't afford Little Knight, you have to... There's only very few decks that you can play at a high level, right? Like, you, Labyrinth, arguably, could get away without it, even though, I, ideally, it still plays it. Um... Branded doesn't play it because it locks it. It literally can't because it locks itself into fusions. Like that's literally it. Pretty much every other deck plays this card, right? Uh, and and actually needs it, right? And so like, I don't want to argue against that. You know, when I say I like SP Little Knight, I don't like every single aspect of the card. But from uh, if I if I ignore the accessibility of the card, um, I have actually noticed that I really enjoy the the gameplay it provides because it doesn't feel like it's um it, it's incredibly powerful uh, and i wouldn't call it a balanced card whatsoever it's not a balanced card because it's better than every other extra deck card probably um but i kind of enjoy the back and forth gameplay and interactions it provides you know the kind of thing because it's not like uh the first of all um like other cards mentioned previously, SP Little Knight is significantly more powerful going second than going first because the the banishing on summon is usually relevant when you go first, usually not relevant when you go uh, usually relevant when you go second, not not as relevant when you go first. Um, and the fact that you can like make an SP, uh, try to banish one of your opponent's card on the board, and if they chain something, you can like for example imperm, you can dodge the imperm by chaining the Little Knight, like being able to interact with multiple pieces of your opponent's board um while at the same time being a um something that it's not like you can't play around it because it has to chain to your opponent's cards right there's like even at the my first ycs i've played with this card right like ycs bologna right I, there's there's been countless scenarios where playing around sp little knight has been a very key part of the game like there's been situations where i would have to summon a magnamute but not activate the Magnamute um, so that the SP couldn't chain to it. I believe that was even on the feature match against Yoho, uh, where I had to go battle phase, summon a Magnamute, not use the Magnamute so that the SP couldn't banish it uh, and save itself, right? And just summon it to attack over... These kind of small... There's a lot of small interactions that, that SP Little Knight um, promotes um, that I think are very, very cool. I actually enjoy playing with this card a lot. And I'm not... Once again, I'm not saying the card's balanced. Um, and the card should definitely not be a freaking hundred bucks and pricing people out of the game. Those factors, I absolutely hate about the card. Um, and the, uh, but I, 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 I do like the gameplay it provides. I just wish it was more accessible, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Cause I actually think the card's design, even though very powerful is very cool and interesting and not as simple as, Hey, this is Baron de Fleur. You are going to play with this card for years now, and it's an Omni Negate, and that's it. I actually uh, enjoy it a lot more. Like, the card design on Little Knight, I think, is a lot better than it is on, like, Baron or Appalooza or Axis Code 
or any of those kind of like it's not as simple it's way more back and forth so i kind of like it sir would completely would you balance it in some way the, the thing is i'm not sure you probably could have made it a little bit weaker i don't know how exactly you do it but like um if you want to make a card that's like uh quote unquote like back and forth and it has a lot of interaction to it and whatnot like if the card isn't super powerful, people are just not going to play it, right? Like, why would I play a card that my opponent can play around and has ways around and whatever if it's not super strong, right? Like, if 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 my if the card isn't isn't super powerful, then I'm just going to play the other extra deck things out there that already exist that um, that don't have that kind of thing um, attached to it. I guess they could have given it less attack, sure, yeah. Uh, they could have made it so that it points to your opponent to give them an error or something. I don't know, man. Like, maybe, yeah. But, like, I, I, that's not what I want to discuss about right now. Like, of course, they could have probably made the card a little bit worse and it would have still been very, very good. I just wanted to get my opinion out there that outside of the price point of this card, I actually am a fan of SP Little Knight. Like, I enjoyed playing with that card a lot. Especially because it just makes it so that... It, 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 it makes it so that you can do something meaningful with your bodies going second into a board. Like, very, very often, um, you can you can start playing into a board with SP Little Knight really, really well, and I just think it, it helps going second more than it does going first. So, and I think that's a good thing in a card. ...find the extra deck, as it not only did Unicorn's job when tagged into with IP, but better... If Link summoned using an extra deck monster as material, banished a card on field or in grave and could, when the opponent activates a card or effect, banish two cards on field until the end phase, including at least one card you controlled. This one Link monster would completely redefine the extra deck, as it not only did Unicorn's job when tagged into with IP, but better, it also provided either more disruption with a DPE-like effect or protection from cards like Imperm, able to remove the monster from the board so it can resolve safely. The number of applications this one card had in the meta are too many to list, so let's just simply see it in action. YCS Indianapolis would take place the same weekend as Agov's release, and if it isn't apparent just from the pie chart, Agov's pieces would completely upend the established meta, so let's dive into what exactly has changed. Vanquished Soul had adapted to Xiaolong and Snow Devil instantly, Foggies. slotting both in to smooth out their fire lines in addition to adding in a copy of SP Little Knight. Get used to me saying that last line, by the way. It won't be the last time you hear it. Resonator Bestial Horus was a newer evolution of Dragon Link that aimed to use the Horus cards to get you to Zombie cool. Vampire to mill for your grave setup. Or, if you were already sufficiently loaded thanks to the Horus cards, Titanic Galaxy for spell negation, with Vision Resonator and Crimson Gaia able to fully shine in a deck full of level 6 darks, giving them easy access to level 8 and 10 synchros. Also, did we skip the 3v3 that pack won by the way i feel like that already happened that that was before little knight wasn't it little knight exo sister would make a surprise appearance here sporting a line we had seen at the regional level a couple of times this year being the sakatama aritama line that allows you to extend yourself into rank fours without special summoning a monster that isn't an exo sister allowing you to still use martha's effect little knight is here monadium would see two tops here as samsara had effectively turned itself into a one card combo able to access a level eight synchro on its own thanks to being vsauce on the field able to link off into a light heart and get play lines rolling say hi to little knight tier would take three top spots here playing similar i mean the funny thing is almost all of the there's other staples that are in almost every deck like like Baron or Dark. The problem, the, the reason why people aren't complaining about these right now is that Dark was printed as a freaking super rare, which that's how it should have been, man. Dark was uh, is also a very powerful card that they released, but they didn't make it a secret somehow. Like, uh, why not? Why? Age of Overlord was still going to be a very good set if SP Little Knight wasn't a goddamn secret rare. You know what I mean? Like, lines to its previous outlets, that's why i don't like it to rise a bit as an extremely potent meta option in the new landscape oh hey little knight pearly would not see too much of a shift in their lineup simply changing what hand trap lines to play with nibiru and roll becoming extremely popular picks yet again it should have it should have maximum been an ultra rare like freaking typhon uh, it, it was going to be worth more than typhon uh so it still would have been an expensive card and the set would have still been incredibly good like age of overlord did not need sp to, to be a secret rare to be a good set the puppy loves Little Knight. Rescue Ace would be unquestionably the biggest winner of the new set release, taking 12 so top like, spots. The thing is, Wanted being expensive is the one thing, right? Because there are other decks that don't need Wanted, but it's very hard to find a deck that doesn't need Little Knight. That's why I have I have a much bigger issue with Little Knight being expensive than, um, than Wanted being expensive. Uh, I think it just generally they should try to make very, very broad, uh, like cards that almost everyone is going to need. Uh, they should try to make those less expensive.
or First less place piloted by Steven Santoli, seeing a massive spike in playability thanks to the Abel Star. As now, Wanted and any other card in your opening can get you to Hydrant, who can search Airlifter, who can search Emergency, which can pop the Airlifter to summon Turbulence, and set four Rescue Ace spell traps with Hydrant on field for their bonus effects. This would completely revolutionize the deck's lines by giving them reliable access to not only Hydrant on turn one, but also Turbulence set four on the yeah. first turn, positioning the deck as an incredibly powerful threat. Also, this time there's two Little Knight. <laughs> with the meta revitalized, Little Knight was without a doubt the star of the show, spiking in price to over $100 by the end of the weekend and would be the new benchmark for extra deck staples moving forward. But let's be completely fair, though he didn't make the top cut here, we all know who and what we remembered from this specific event. Boy. Another oh leg. yeah, all right. One more piece, the crowd is chanting, one more piece. This is clean, this is very clean. We got the other arm, and all five pieces have been assembled. The legs, the arms, the head, Exodia obliterate. Unbelievable. Wow, the crowd goes insane. Jeff Leonard, also known as the dad of Yu-Gi-Oh, would perform an Exodia FDK live on stream during round four of this event, not once, but twice, energizing the crowd around him and making easily one of the most memorable moments in the entire year for the- We should play this deck in Master Duel sometime. I need to check how many of these are ultra rares. I know Celine is, but meh competitive scene. YCS Santa Cruz would be a week later, and following the upheaval that was YCS Indianapolis, the meta appeared to have restabilized between various different strategies, with no clear best deck in the format as even the decks with high percentages didn't hold a convincing margin. Infernoble would see a top spot here, sporting the new equip spell Angelica's Angelic Ring to provide an extra spell negate. Sword Soul would take two top spots here, one playing the standard Tenyi Sword Soul, and one playing super heavy Samurai Tenyi Sword Soul, showing that older decks with lower power levels can uh, top in the format as long as players who are comfortable with them can pilot them effectively, with the meta so wide open that almost anything competent can top. One of the most massive upsets here was unquestionably Diabellstar Mekonko, taking first place piloted by Michael Verissimo right. da Silva, which would be the first deck to fully rock Ken and Gen to their fullest extent. By triggering Ken or Gen, you can place a monster on the opponent's field in the center column. In doing so, you can combo using any other pieces of extension into Ice Hold, which in turn can loop you through your Mekonko lines for setup, summoning Geonator Transverser, summon an Acid Golem, and swap it to the opponent's board, which in turn locks them out of special summons, and with the Mekonko monsters would reflect battle damage back to the opponent, being extremely powerful in the unfocused metagame. This would lead into the next set a week later, and though Agov was absolutely powerful, this one would give it a run for best set of the year, being an absolute crowd pleaser that we could have only dreamed of. Oh, rarity of. collection, right? I mean, I think this one takes best product of the year, at least in my book. I think Age of Overlord is most impactful product of the year. I think is, a, is an easy way to, to phrase it, because this didn't introduce any new cards. This is just reprints, accessibility. Like, this, I think this is the best, the best product of the year overall um age of overlord of course more impactful okay why is this so loud holy rarity collection release date november 2nd 2023 set type reprint set major strategies staples impact the bottom out of the staple market. Rarity Collection was a first of its kind set, bringing reprints of 79 of the most popular cards in the game, two of which got both regular and alt art printings in seven different rarities each, ranging from the low rarity of super all the way up to the max rarity of quarter century secret rare. Because every card was printed in every rarity, the secondary market was flooded with all of these staples, making some variants extremely cheap to obtain while others being pricier. As of the nature of this set was reprinting meta staples, it would be next to impossible for me to read off all of the major reprints here without going on for a long time. So here are a couple of highlights. I did open the TCG version of the rarity collection, but sadly the card quality is so bad for some reason. Is it? I haven't noticed that at all. I, I, all the cards I got from it were fine. Um, but I don't know, maybe, maybe you got unlucky, but I'm not sure. I guess uh, if, you are, if you're from the OCG, I, I guess they might still be worse than, than what you guys have. I know, I know your guys' rarities might still look a lot better. Like, you know, maybe you're, maybe you're just comparing it to, uh, to the OCG cards, which, you know, they, they're probably better, you know? Effect Failure, Tour Guide, Ash Blossom, Dimension Shifter, Borlode Savage Dragon, Baron to Floor, Time Thief Redoer, Selene. I mean, you could literally list like almost all 79 cards. There's some lore cards in there that didn't need to be there for competitive players, but you know. Heart, Called by the Grave, Pot of Extravagance. We probably are listing more, a lot of Lightning them. Lightning <laughs> Storm, Nadir Servant, Triple Tactics Talent, Pot of Prosperity, Dimensional Barrier, Evenly Matched, and Infinite Impermanence, all receiving reprints here. With the max rarity hunting making this probably one- Chat, what's your favorite rarity from the rarity collection? Right now, spam it right now. I need I need to know. I know I've asked this question before. Mine is collectors. I've I've gotten a lot of collectors rares from it. I've, I, I have doubled, I've gone down, uh, a lot of the staples in collectors is what I've gone for.
the, the most fun sets ever to open seal. Yeah, that is YCS true. Richmond would be held the same weekend, and similar to previous events, the meta was so volatile that there would be no clear top deck, with Unchained taking the most representation here, but not being the undisputed best deck in format, with Tear, Rescue Ace, Infernoble, Pearly, and Labyrinth all putting up numbers to make a case for themselves too. Joseph Bellafiore would win the day on Unchained, playing a fairly standard lineup to what we've expected to see at this point with a slightly heavier hand trap line. This would lead into the last pack of the year, and it seemed to be poised to do something similar to what Wild Survivors did earlier that year. For Valen, better what is that, Valen Smashers? Valiant Smashers. Oh. Release date, November 17th, 2023. Set type, deck building set. Major strategies, Memento, Centurion, Valmonica. Impact, the Vanquish Soul Treatment. Valiant Smashers was the last pack of the year, and though it was- Kind of, right? Kind of the Vanquish Soul Treatment. Not quite there, though. Not quite. It's- it, it, it. I think what they did with Valiant Smashers is uh, quite similar to Wild Survivors because they realized, okay, one of these three archetypes is better than the other two um and we want to make those we want to give those more ultras right but it wasn't seven it was five right it was five ultras which is still bad but it was less bad than uh than what they did with vanquish soul it still wasn't a good set because the other two were another just so solid bad, archetype right? in centurion the other two archetypes felt absolutely abysmal please read the pinned comment i made a massive mess up with the set's coverage uh my info on Valiant Smash was a bit off, specifically in terms of Memento. Bup, bup, bup. This resulted in not only non-updated text, but also me missing that the strategy had three ultra rares in the set, not zero. Okay. Noted on release that it was clear this particular set was not going to be well received. The first of these was Memento, a series of retrains of various DM era vanilla monsters focused on popping their own cards to access other mementos. With Tatsunu's Toshigo able to summon itself from hand while you only control mementos, can pop a memento you control to dump mementos from deck to grave whose total levels equal the one you popped, Darkblade able to discard a memento on summon to pop an opponent's spell trap and able to destroy a memento you control to summon a level 3 or lower memento from deck, Anguish able to search a memento on summon and can pop a memento to revive a level 2 or lower memento in grave, Mace who can discard itself if you control a combined creation to take an opponent's monster until the end phase, and while on field can pop a memento to search a memento card, Goblin who can discard if you control combined creation to get mementos effect targeting protection and while on field can pop a memento to dump up the two different mementos from deck and their payoffs being memento land horn dragon who can summon itself from hand if you have three or more different memento monsters in grave and when popped on field can pop three other cards on field including a memento you control and combined creation who can only be summoned by returning five other memento this one was from... ultra rare right and then it was bone party or whatever or grave to deck or and then one deck. more can attack all monsters once if it's the only monster you control and if the opponent activates a card or effect can summon a memento from hand or grave once per turn for spell traps they receive memento mid -Kalon, a field spell that stuns back row when a memento battles summons a memento from hand or grave with a lower level than one destroyed and can reset a memento spell trap in the end phase bone party a quick play spell that pops a memento on field or in hand to search one one the from grave to give a memento piercing that turn bone back a quick play spell that can when the opponent removes a memento oh from the field, witch was also summon a combined ultra, okay. creation from hand or deck ignoring its summoning conditions and can banish itself from grave if the opponent moves a memento out of grave to summon as many different mementos as possible from hand or deck fracture dance a trap that can pop a card on field if you control a memento and another if you control combined creation and if a memento battles an opponent's monster can be banished from grave to drop all opponent's monsters by a thousand attack and cranium burst a continuous trap that forces the opponent to only attack the strongest memento on field and can drop a combined creation's attack and defense by a thousand each to destroy and negate a monster who activates its effect on field once per chain while the deck has an extremely capable combo line and setup it could do the payoff just wasn't there leaving this as one of two archetypes memento is one of those archetypes where it's really up in the air right now it's not playable um and it's really up to konami i suppose if they want to make it good or not because they could like the cards have the potential on there like if they if they make good memento support you can you know you can make it good we will see you know i mean i'm just i mean we've just talked about it like uh pearly and rescue ace and whatever how these decks looked at first release you know like if they want to, they can make this stuff good. We'll see. Completely forgotten on release. The other one of these was Valmonica, a duo of pendulum monsters that share an effect. Kind of similar to these, even though I would say Valmonica is probably the worst out of the three. Um, but once again, if they make custom cards for this archetype, then who knows what's going to happen. Two, while in hand, discard another card to set both themselves and their counterpart from deck into the scales. Can banish from Valmonica's have, to I have less from faith in life Valmonica. Gain effect in the case of Angelo and the damage effect in the case of Demono. Both gaining counters in scale when you control the other scale and either gain life or take damage, and each had one other scale effect. With Angelo, Link summoning a Valmonica Link using monsters you control when the opponent attacks, and Demono dropping the opponent's monsters attack by 100 for each counter on herself. Their links were Duraloom, a Link one that can only be summoned if you have three or more counters on Angelo, can destroy opponent's monsters on summon up to the number of counters in your scales, and can remove three counters from your scales to attack three times that battle phase. And Zabufra, a Link one that can only be summoned if you have three or more counters on Demono, can remove three counters from your scales to protect cards from destruction, and can apply a Valmonica spell trap effect from Grave on the opponent's turn on a quick effect. Their spell trap line includes Agatha a logical voice, a field spell that searches a Valmonica monster on activation and steals an opponent's monster if one of your skills hits three counters. Skelta. That sounded demonic on two times speed. 
which either gains 500 life to place a card in hand on bottom of deck to draw two, or takes 500 to search a different Valmonica spell trap, or Sare, which either gains 500 life to excavate until you hit a Valmonica card to add to hand, or deals 500 to dump a Valmonica card from deck to grave, into Nare, which either gains 500 life to summon a monster from grave with the opponent's choice, or deals 500 to add a level 4 monster from grave to hand, followed rhythm, a trap that can either gain 500 to pop a spell trap, or take 500 to bounce a monster on field to hand, needing to control a Valmonica to activate, and able to do both if you control a Valmonica link, and chosen melody, which either gains 500 to give Valmonica's targeting protection from effects that turn, or takes 500 to negate a monster effect on field that turn, needing to control a Valmonica to activate, and able to do both if you control a Valmonica link. To put it bluntly, Valmonica on their own were completely worthless. They needed to be splashed <laughs> okay. with a strategy like Perform Age to even get off the ground. And even Yo. then, it's just Link 1 and Rank 4 spam with other strategies doing infinitely better in that regard, leaving the strat dead on arrival. The last archetype was Centurion, a series of monsters able to be turned into continuous traps that all share the effect to summon themselves once per turn if they're in the back row, with Primera being a tuner that protects high-level Centurions from card effect destruction while as a trap and can search- Uh, hear me out. Centurion is actually pretty cool. They need, they need to do two things to make Centurion a cool and based and viable deck, right? They need to, uh, maybe three things. Uh, they, the, the most important thing is they need to ban King Calamity because this deck cannot be based while King Calamity exists. Um, the other thing is if they ban King Calamity, they need to give it another good level 12 to summon on the opponent's turn. Like Legacia, Legacia is, is okay to summon on the opponent's turn. You know, draw a card, pop a card, fine, you know, okay. But like they need to give it, uh, they because the deck has the gimmick to sum synchro summon on the opponent's turn specifically, right? They kind of need a card that is specifically designed to be summoned on the opponent's turn. Because like with Legatia, it's kind of like the card is designed to be summoned to be good on both turns, right? Like if I summon it going first, I can draw a card. I get to set back in the end phase. You know, cool. The card is good going first. If you summon it on your opponent's turn, you get to pop a card on top. Like, yeah, I get it. You know, the card is meant to be summoned on both turns and be good on both turns. Fine. But the effect is not good enough for on the opponent's turn, right? Like, we need we need a Centurion Synchro that's meant to be summoned on the opponent's turn only. Like, only on the opponent's turn, right? Um, so that we replace the need to having, to having to go Crimson Dragon into Calamity, right? Because ban Calamity and then go from there, right? Uh, and then the other thing that they would need is like a way to like because they have one line and one line only right and if the, if that one line gets disrupted they pretty much can't really do anything um and they would need a way around that i don't know how you would do that like uh, i don't know maybe just different line essentially like just give them a give them a freaking second second line of play that they can do except of the standard combo that we have um because they have a, they have actually very few cards they only have very few cards you, you we're almost using every single card off the archetype you know they have exactly those three main deck monsters uh exactly those spells there's the only thing that we don't play is we don't play both trap cards for the deck right we play everything else so like we need more we need maybe a secondary tuner that we can summon out in some way you know whatever right like uh, you know th this kind of stuff just Centurion on summon, Trudea able to place itself and a Centurion from deck in the back row, locking itself from summoning for the rest of the turn, able to boost its level by 4 when summoned from the back row by its own effect, and at the 6th, able to bump a Centurion from the front line to the back row to summon itself from hand or grave, and Legatia, a level 12 synchro that gives battle protection to 2k or lower attack monsters, draws a card on summon, can destroy the highest attack opponent's monster. Because I actually think Centurion itself is really, really cool. I really enjoyed it when I played it as well. Like, uh, we, we've tested it on stream. I thought it was a really cool deck. Um, I just wish it had a little bit more lines instead of just one, <laughs> and it didn't. It wasn't just calamity turbo essentially. And in the end phase, places a non-synchro centurion from hand or grave into the back row. Their spell trap line includes stand up, a field spell that protects itself while you control a centurion. Can send a card from hand to grave the turn it's activated. Also, I have uh, I have uh, collector's rare stand up, so I would appreciate if they would make it good even after banning calamity. Thank you to place a Centurion from deck in the back row, and let you quick synchro summon after summoning a monster using at least one Centurion monster, Emblema Oath, which either places a Centurion from deck in the back row, or sets a Centurion spell trap from deck, Bonds, which places a Centurion from hand or grave into the back row, and can banish itself from grave when a Centurion synchro is summoned, place a Centurion from grave in the back row, Phalanx, which banishes a monster on field until the standby phase of the next turn, and can banish itself from grave to summon a Centurion synchro from grave, but drops its attack by 1500, and True Awakening, an Omni Negate counter trap that sends monsters from the back row to grave for cost. Needless to say, this was the strategy among the three that held potential, being adept at swarming the board repeatedly for synchro 8 and 12 pushes that recurred their pieces regularly to do it again the next turn, seeing some experimentation on release. The issue lied in, once again, Konami printed most of the deck's good pieces in the ultra rare slot. Uh, the giveaway is over. Yeah, we're. I'm, I'm gonna announce the winners on the Discord though. If you weren't here, you're not gonna miss it. Which completely shafted the rest of the archetypes. With five of the seven slots going to Centurion, two going to Valmonica, and none going to Memento, being the most overly blatant up rarity scaling done since earlier this year when okay, they. Okay, yeah. So this is not. This is not entirely correct. It's, it was three Memento Ultras, two Valmonica Ultras, and five Centurion Ultras, which is. Um, better than what they did with Vanquish Soul, but it was still a bad set because, you know, I mean, it's just not good if only one of the three archetypes is good.
the, the Vanquish Soul. Though this was the last pack of 2023, it was not the last set release, as we still had one more structure deck to hit the masses, and it was aimed at giving one last shakeup to finish the year off with a bang. Fire Kings. Release date, December 8th, 2023. Set type, structure deck. Major strategies, Fire King. Impact, sacrifice the Fire King. Well, that's not very advanced. <laughs> the Fire King structure deck was the final set release of the year, giving us one last batch of toys to play with before the final YCS of the year, aiming to revitalize Fire King into a proper modern strategy. This support included Sacred Fire King Garunix, able to summon itself from hand or grave when a fire monster is destroyed, popping a fire tri-type from deck on summon and gaining that monster's attack. High Avatar Kirin, able to summon itself from hand by popping a fire on field or in hand in the main phase on a quick effect, able to revive a Fire King when destroyed, destroying a card on... These cards are very, very good, and I'm actually, I'm, I'm very happy that they already saw success at YCS Bologna, even without uh, the full-on fire support from next year. Like, basically, it feels like, we're going to talk about that in a second, even though we don't even have that much time left. Dude, we've been watching this for so long, I don't regret one second of it, though. Um, in 2024, it feels like a lot of these fire decks are going to be, they are still Fire King rescue ace whatever you want to call it but i feel like they lose a little bit of their identity because a lot of it is just the snake eye combo and then it's just whatever you do on the side maybe that's just my first impression of it because i actually haven't played it yet and they, they could still very well be fun to play and all that but it feels like a lot of them are snake eye decks with a slightly other side engine and they are only labeled as fire king rescue ace in the overall deck breakdowns right but it's mostly um it's mostly snake eye decks really with different in different shades you know what i mean um i'm happy that fire king was able to hold up its own as its own deck like it was actually its own deck at ycs bologna right they used the diabell star cards as an engine as, as a way to get to the fire king cards but like it was still a fire king deck right um and so and the cards are really good so i was i was i was happy to see that they were able to perform like that on field when you do ring because it got like four top spots in in bologna which is not bad like that's actually that's respectable able to summon itself from hand when a face-up fire king is destroyed able to destroy another fire on field or in hand to negate a spell or trap effect ponix able to summon itself from hand if a fire is destroyed able to search a fire king spell trap on summon returning itself to hand the standby phase after it's destroyed sanctuary a continuous spell able to activate island from deck on activation can pop a fire monster to protect your field spell from destruction and when the opponent special summons a monster can exceed summon a fire exceed using fire kings you control Skyburn, a quick play spell able to pop an equal number of fire kings you control and cards the opponent controls, able to banish itself from grave to prevent a fire. Pretty much all of these cards up until here are really, really good for the deck. Fire king from being destroyed by card effect, and their new exceed Grunix Eternity. And that's rank it. seven, the nukes all monsters on summon can detach a material to pop a spell trap on field, boosting by 500 attack when it does, and when destroyed while it has material, summons that many fire kings from grave. This wave of support would bring fire king into the modern era successfully, with Ponix specifically being an insane one card starter for the strategy. It will set up the deck to end on island, sanctuary, and two level sevens to make Grunix Eternity on the opponent's turn when they special summon. Because of Ponix alone being a full combo for the deck, players would experiment with various other engines to go with it. From Tri Brigade, thanks to the fire Tri type synergy with sacred. Garunix able to pop a kid in deck. Dogmatica, since the Deer Servant could get you to Ponix plus floor interaction thanks to Garura, Maximus, Shureg, and Titanicalad. And most importantly, Dia Bellstar being able to summon Ponix through Sinful Spoil Snake Eye. Or instead, potentially summoning Snake Eye Ash to search Ponix for a full board setup that could realistically end on four plus interaction points. YCS Bologna would be held the same weekend, Ooh. being the last YCS of the year, and from it, we'd see even more decks enter the field of viable decks, shifting the top cut distribution even more, with now seven different decks taking at least four top spots and 17 different decks making top cut in total. Kashtira would make a crack into top cut here, playing a pseudo stun game with a heavier focus on Shangri Era and another Kashtira to lock up the board and stun out opponents' options, similarly to what they were doing pre Arise Heart. Centurion would take four top spots here with three different variants, being a Horus variant providing additional level 8 bodies for easy level 12 synchro access, Bestials giving variety to the lines with level 10 access and grave control, and even the super heavy Samurai variant for quick and easy starting lines in Wakaoshi. Fire King would take four top spots on its first outing as well, with all four playing the Dia Bellstar engine as an additional way into Ponix to start your lines, with one player adding in the Snake Eye pieces for the Amblo Whale setup line. Joshua Schmidt would take the event on a deck Ooh. no one was expecting, being Bestial Runic, using Quim for access to Cartesia for synchro plays, Bestial Luber as a searchable level 4 tuner, branded regain for its interactions with SB Little Knight, able to turn its temporary banish into a permanent one, and most uniquely, duality, which could access a variety of different options in the extra deck off of the various levels and attributes in the deck. Such who mega lol? Who mega lol? Off yes, we get it. Perm, Unicorn <laughs> off Gary to lock the opponent out of the game, and Scarlight Red Dragon Archfiend off Abyssal Lubellion to burn for time. This win would also put Schmidt at four total YCS wins, placing him in spitting distance of the most YCS wins record at third place behind Cotton and LeBlanc's five. Oh, we're so close. And with that, 2023 in Yu-Gi-Oh would come to an end. 
capping off an absolutely jam-packed year full of variety and changes all around, being one of the most exciting years in the game's history overall. I'd like to take a minute right here at the end to thank everyone who's helped this channel grow over the past year, as this has also been one of the biggest years of growth in my channel's history too. For starters, a big nice. shout out to everyone nice. I've collaborated with over the course of this year. Chaotic Meatball, Axe Mango, Sen, MBT, Scarlon, Golden Nova, We're Fire and Dance, Nim outs. Nim, Jaxel, Skep, and Nash. You've all helped in your own ways and I cannot thank you enough. A big shout out also to New Took and Fiery Dance for their wonderful art that's been used throughout my videos this year. It's brought a new sense of flair to my content this past year that I couldn't have done on my own. Another big shout out to Joshua Schmidt specifically, whose hey. reaction videos to my yearly recaps have actually boosted <laughs> my audience immensely, which I severely appreciate. Lastly, uh, you're welcome. I mean, I'm only watching the videos because they're really, really well made. I appreciate you for your content. Thank you for making these. Uh, and I am glad that, you know, me reacting to them is is helping your channel. Uh, very, very nice. Thank you. Very wholesome. Um, yeah, I hope uh, I hope you do. I hope you keep doing what you do. And uh, I hope you keep seeing success with it because these are phenomenal. I enjoyed this one again very much. I mean, I'll, I'll keep it running. But... but certainly not least, a massive shout out to my patrons. Damn it, Marco. Heyo. Jack Taporek. Jukes, Otaku GamerX, Prinrin, Ryza339, and all of my other patrons over on Patreon.com. If you'd like to support me making this kind of long-form content, which does take a lot of effort to make consistently, please consider supporting me on Patreon, where support tiers start at as little as $1 a month to watch my content a day early. And if you're new here, please consider subscribing to the channel. I just wanted to make sure you saw... Okay, okay. <laughs> I mean, we're done. Okay. All right, chat. I'll drop the link once more in the in the in the thingy. You guys go over to the Law YGO, uh, leave some love. Uh subscribe to the channel i'm not subscribed this is oh because i'm in my, I logged into the plus channel i'm logged in on the main channel trust me Keep. see subscribed easy um yeah go go ahead and subscribe to the to the thing and uh and and you you know the, you know the good stuff all right um and with that you know couldn't have asked for could not have asked for a better um roundup of 2023 um i mean yeah personally i thought how did you guys like Yu-Gi-Oh this year i feel like it was a good year for it i mean like cash tira i feel like we started we started a little rough with uh you know the aftermath of ishizu tier format and and cash tira format even though with even though those two formats you know they had their problems <laughs> obviously but even in those kind of formats, I feel like it wasn't all that bad, you know? Like, it was it was still... I, I enjoyed the game during those times, you know? Are they my favorite formats ever? Probably not. Am I going to go back to playing those? Probably not. But I I liked it overall. And then after... I feel like after a Rise Heart got banned, it just got gradually better and better and better over time. Um... I liked it, and that's all. That's even just the TCG part. I also really enjoyed Master Duel. Um, even though I mean, freaking Roach is still here. Um, I still really enjoy Master Duel. It gives me. I, I still have a phenomenal time whenever I'm playing Master Duel on stream. It's like a, a great way to to stream the game. I enjoy it. You guys seem to enjoy it. You know, I like Master Duel. <laughs> I also, you know, Master Duel Worlds was okay. Um, no, I've I've been having a blast this year in 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 the TCG and Master Duel uh, on Twitch. It's it's been great. Um So yeah. You don't miss Kick Close. You're lying. I know that. I know you're lying. I know you're lying. <laughs>